<laughs> you weren't there, first of all, so you wouldn't know, right? But I, I would know how I came into this world <laughs> via forceps. <laughs> I was very late. Okay. I was in the womb for 10 months. Wow, really? Mm -hmm. Jeez, hold on. Oh. We're about to go live. Just Actually, I think we are. Are we already live? Okay. Just give us a second, guys. And oh, we're live. I oh, see yourself already. <laughs> How do I share this? I feel like such a. Here it is. Here we go. Hey. Wait, can you help me? <laughs> Hold on. Wait, no. Which is. How do I share? Just press the button that says share. Oh, here, here. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> For someone who's always on Facebook, no? Um, I think we have to turn off the audio because like, we can hear ourselves. It sounds weird. <coughs> Good afternoon, guys. We are about to start. Make sure if you have any questions for the Philosopher podcast, make sure you get ready with them. Oh, sorry. It's still there. Okay. <coughs> it's like, uh, what is that movie? Um, it's like a, sh a movie within a movie within a movie. <laughs> um, <laughs> What's that movie, man? Leonardo DiCaprio, right? Yeah, it's... Uh, what was that? Inception. Inception, yeah. It's a dream within a dream. Dream movie, within yeah. a dream within a dream. Okay. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the Philosopher Podcast. Uh, please help me welcome my guest here for uh, today. We have uh, one of the youngest appointees uh, of the uh, uh, President uh, Gloria Macapagalaroyo cabinet, uh, an uh, assistant secretary. Of course, he's now a commissioner <laughs> in uh, the uh, uh, Cebu Ports Authority, and he's also a an internet sensation. I would like to say, <laughs> ladies and gentlemen, <laughs> Mike Acevedo Lopez. Good Hi. afternoon, Mike. Hi, Jigs. Thank you for having me. It's been a long time. Uh, um, I haven't <laughs> talked to you, uh, spoken to you in a long, long time, and I've always wanted to guest you here in the Philosopher Podcast. Thank you so much for finding time. And you know, in fact, I just put in my caption and I shared the video. I have, I've been saying no to interviews the past several years. Well, well thank you for saying yes so. to this one. <laughs> Whose interview have you said no to? Uh, let's, no, no, no. let's not put them on the spot. <laughs> Did you say no to CNN and yes to the Philosopher Podcast? Not CNN, but... <laughs> Maybe BBC, because yeah, I was in the United Kingdom. <laughs> anyway, Mike, good afternoon, and thank you so much, like I said, for uh, uh, taking uh, time off from your very busy schedule. I know you're preparing for something big in the next few days. And uh, in fact, um, you're preparing for a trip somewhere. Yeah. And uh, that's why uh, you couldn't maybe say yes to the other interviews. But thank you so much for saying yes to this one. First and foremost, my, my favorite question always is, Mike, uh, tell me about the background of your youth. Tell us about how um, you became who you are today. Uh, give us the long story of how uh, we have you today as a, a CPA commissioner and an a internet sensation and uh, and one of the youngest appointees in the uh, Gloria Macapagal Arroyo uh, administration. Tell us about uh, the uh, long story of how you came to be. Well, you know, it's, it all started with uh, USC, you know, the University of San Carlos, where I was a student leader. Uh, I wasn't the best student, <laughs> okay. but I, prob I was more studious uh, as a youth leader. I was more committed than that. It just gave me, you know, it made me come alive. Uh, it was the sort of thing, I, that's when I met you. I was uh, yeah. very active in, in, in USC. And um, I just felt that I needed the real world experience uh, as early as possible alongside my, my education. Uh, so it was a good time. It, it really exposed me to a lot of things, to a lot of different ideas, different uh, value systems, different kinds of politics. And uh, there was always this interest in politics, always. And some people don't get it. Uh, they say, but your parents, they're, they're the most apolitical, and they still are. Um, you don't really get to talk about politics. I'm probably the only politically, I'm probably the only interested person in uh, when it comes to politics in my family. Uh, but I do have a lot of relatives. Uh, so there's, and you know, forebears who were and still are in uh, different government uh, positions, uh, different capacities. 
and they're also from different political persuasions. And this, it's through genetic memory, through exposure to them, all of these things have probably uh, made made me who I am, no? uh, how interested I am in politics. So when I was- Were you, were you thrust into that uh, uh, when you were a student? As a student leader, were you thrust into that? Were you just gravitating uh, to a political organization uh, in school? I was actually invited okay. by the three campus political parties in USC. Why was that? I don't know because I, I'm very opinionated. Yeah. I'm so, very so you're already very opinionated even before you became a student leader? Yes. Okay. Uh, in, even in high school. Okay. <laughs> my, my high school classmates can attest to that. Okay. I would always be noisy. I would, even before I learned the term filibuster, <laughs> you, uh, were, you were already I a filibuster. I would filibuster. To delay an exam. <laughs> <laughs> like, how do you delay an exam? I ask all these questions. Okay, Some, like, know, like what, for example? Uh, so, for example, <laughs> in social studies, uh, world history, there's this uh, one of those uh, uh, descendants of modern man. Um, <laughs> no, this ascendants of modern man. Uh, 15, 14 something BC man is what it's called. I don't remember what it, what it's called exactly, but something something 1400 BC man, something like that. So I said. So there's going to be a quiz. So before we start, I just have a question. <laughs> <laughs> but it was really a genuine question. I wanted to... Uh, so, so your intention was not to delay the, the, the both. exam? Both. It's hitting two birds. Okay, no? okay. Um, so <laughs> that's the, the secret to success for me is you have to have uh, not just one interest. Okay. You have to have at least more than one. Okay. No? Two. Uh, yours, it could be someone else's, or you have two interests just for you. Okay. Because then it will fuel you to succeed. <laughs> <laughs> if it's just one, then it doesn't make sense. Wh so, okay. to delay, and of course to get answers. Um, and then a third interest there is, that was, uh, th that, that person was a... Uh, you mean the a, teacher? A practice teacher. Okay. A pra uh, practical teacher. So, it's a, we, I studied in Cebu Normal. Contrary to popular belief, people think I went to Sacred Heart. Uh, but I actually went to... Uh, CNU. Okay. Um, anyhow, that's a different story. Um, so I said, it's our job, you know, because they will be future teachers. And then there's a critic teacher behind and making sure that everything is. So uh, did you give the, so the I, teacher a hard time? Well, it seems it seemed like it because it's, it, so when did this person exist? Okay. So is it literally, let's say 14 something BC man? Is it literally 1000 one something years before Christ? And she said, yes. I go, how is that even possible? So you're saying that the Egyptian civilization, which is 5,000 to 10,000 BC, <laughs> and they look like people already. You mean Homo sapiens as we know they, it now? Yeah, Homo uh, sapiens like as, us. as okay. like us, uh -huh. except that they were Egyptians. Um, that even after that, even after people like us existed, Homo sapiens as you know it existed, at some, at some point later on, closer to when Christ was born, that, that kind of uh, humanoid still existed. I mean, it's just a commonsensical uh, concern. And then... <laughs> so so he had to, she had to explain it uh, for the entire duration, and so the it, exam was postponed. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Thank so you, Mike. So that was just one example. So, so please, please continue so, with, with your life story, Mike. Go ahead. Anyway, so fast forward to college. <laughs> uh, I would always, you know... I, it's not, I'm not like Hermione Granger and okay. I would raise my hand, no. But if I'm told to speak, so I would really express yourself. Express myself. Okay. And for some reason, I don't know why, I was nominated for a uh, for a Carolinian Freshman of the Year. My grades were okay. okay. So average at best, yeah. I was oh. in the dean's list. Okay, you know, so, I was in the uh, dean's so list, yeah. above average. Yeah. So and then I was invited uh, by three parties. The first was uh, a leftist party. Okay. The one who invited me. Is that Tingog? No, Tingog is left Sorry. of center. Okay. Cent centrist, left of center. What's the leftist party of the USC? Because I'm also Stan, from you. Stan. Ah, Stan. Yeah, Thank I you remember. for not remembering. <laughs> Stan, Stan. No. Okay. But I have good friends from that party. Okay. Know, like my contemporaries. The younger ones hate me with a passion. But okay. That's fine. Okay. You know, it's part of being relevant. Uh -huh. <laughs> <laughs> no. So, uh, the Stan was the first to invite me only because my classmate was super hardcore. His name is Victor. I've Super seen, hardcore left. Yes. Okay. Like really communist. He would read books from Mao. Wow. Okay. Uh, Lenin. What uh, you know, all these like uh, the leftist ideology yes. uh, thought leaders. But you know, and then I said, I I'm really in not no man super hardcore ideal ideal. What's this? Ideologue. Uh, yeah, I'm not an ideologue. Mm. No. Uh, but it has to at least be there. 
I, I like to be creative. You make you make things up as we go along. You know, it depends on what the problem is, and that's what we try to address. We can't be too stuck on an ideology. Exactly. You know, we have to be at least flexible, malleable. Yeah. You know, the 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 most passionate ideologues became the worst fascists, the fir- the worst dictators. Uh, Hitler, I'm sure, had his ideology, and he imposed it onto the world. So you have to be flexible. So, so that was you back in college. Yeah, but I was I was processing. So it. did you have success in your political life as a college student? I I never I never I was never in the student council. Oh, okay, you never, never ran for office. I ran, but I had an accident. Okay. So I couldn't campaign. Okay. When I was in fresh when okay. I was a freshman, so I didn't win. Okay. I couldn't campaign, but I was almost there. <laughs> I didn't make it. After that, I realized I want to be a kingmaker. A I wanna, kingmaker. I want to spot talents okay. and work behind the scenes. That's more fun, no? Um, and you don't have to act a certain way like a politician. You can be yourself because you have to. You can face the other parties and and not have to toe the line or walk ar- walk on eggshells around people or issues or so. That's the, I, I made a, a a conscious decision at the time. But so going back, so he was. Uh, he was inviting me to, to to stand, and I said, you know what? It's good if you subscribe to that I- ideology. Then great. There has to be. There will always be a segment of the camp of the student population that will subscribe to the leftist ideology, and it also depends on the issues in school. It's like in America, if they need a mother, they will vote Democrat. If they need, if the nation needs a father, they will b- vote Republican. If they need stronger uh, uh, foreign policy, uh, you know. Um, protection from ag- foreign aggression depending on the need at that time they will vote republican if they need social services they will vote de- democrat similarly in in usc uh, <laughs> okay so it was a microcosm yeah, of the world there's a lot of tuition increase okay. or you know, uniform whatever uh, stand will win okay because they're very rara about those issues that's 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 how it is that's the reality of campus politics so tingog is more sober we, we may fight it but we're uh, we don't broadcast the fight we do it behind closed doors, dialogue, blah, blah, blah. There was no social media at that time, right? No social media. So, um, anyway, I sorry, I I said I really cannot because I'm a capitalist. You're a capitalist. <laughs> no, okay. Well, not the man. I met me just sucked them, social okay. democrat. Uh, there was a part of me that was still anti, but at that point, I was, there, there was an aha moment. I was re- in, a, in my high school years, I was more so- social, a social democrat. So it's anti GATT WTO, mm-hmm. General Agreement on Tariffs and Trades, World Trade Organization, um, you know, globalization. Mm-hmm. Because that was my exposure. I was reading about that and I was anti. In fact, I was anti Gloria Arroyo. Okay, okay. And now we talk about it and we laugh. And she, she said, What happened? <laughs> Kumam, I'm so anti you. Because she would attend the Acevedo Optical uh, Christmas party, you know, corporate Christmas parties. Because she's a relative. Okay. She's a pangan makapagal, and the Acevedos are pangan Acevedos. Okay. And I never. Was excited uh-huh. that she, you know she would attend. I was anti GMA when she was senator because she was the champion of globalization in the Senate. Uh-huh. And then 2000 2001 came. That was my freshman year. And then Winnie Munsod, uh, respected economist. Now we don't see eye to eye on politics because she's very anti Duterte. Mm-hmm. Winnie Munsod, who I actually look up to. Uh, I love econ- I, I didn't take up economics, but I love uh, studying uh, you know economics. Um, she said. You know, it's a bit too late to be anti-globalization because you're already we're already here. We're already here, yeah. You're using the phone. The, no- the, the Nokia, train has left. <laughs> the Nokia phone that you're using <laughs> is a product of globalization. Everything that you're wearing right now. Who's using a Nokia phone? <laughs> a fifty-one ten with Express on cover. <laughs> so, um, so that was my coming of age, really. I mean, in 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 the political sense, I said pitaw, no, and then I started appreciating GMA. And then that's the what what part of GMA, uh, knowing that you despised her political stance at that time, what what drew you to her? Well, I was ob- observing you know what she was what, what she was doing uh, when she was a senator and when she was vice president. Okay. Her work ethic, everything. So I started. But it was not her ideology, but her work ethic that work drew ethic you to her. And well, the pragmatism of okay. it all that you know sometimes when you're so anti-globalization, that's an idealistic, yeah. ultra idealistic perspective. So. I was, you know, you temper your idealism. So that's when I started to learn. You compartmentalize things. Idealism, you impose it on yourself. Uh, but I would learn that, uh, I would fine tune that mentality later on. But, you know, you, you impose it onto yourself, but you don't expect it from everyone else. That's when you become judgmental and hypo- hypocritical. So, uh, 
I saw that there was some pragmatism there, and she was making the economy work with the policies that she passed as senator. And then when she, this was about, she was about to become president, but she was vice president. She I wanted her over air up. So I, I started reading if she was a palatable, uh, what do you call this? Candidate uh, for president? No, no, she was vice of okay. Arab. So she, if she was a palatable alternative in case Arab is ousted. Okay. So people say, ah, oh, she's a bit, uh, what do you call this, ambitious because she was actually actively she's already freaking vice president of course she's ambitious we have to be ambitious and 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 what's wrong with the word ambitious <laughs> right what's what's wrong with the word exactly. ambitious? just don't step on other people's toes okay. so anyway it's the impeachment <coughs> trial etc uh so that changed things and so when i was going back i was talking to my to my fr to my friend okay said i cannot be because i'm borderline social democrat left of center to centrist but i'm really for enlightened capitalism you know not naman unabated greed because I'd be hypocritical. We come from a family. Our family is fourth generation. Nah, mm. uh, the, our family business. How can I say that I would be un ingrato, ungrateful if I say I'm not for business and then you benefit from it, right? So it started there. I didn't even know about Tingog yet. There was a second party that invited me. I was in not interested. When Tingog came, well, I liked what I saw. And um, superficial it may be, as uh, it may be. The one who invited me, she was a pretty girl, very articulate and very pretty. So, you know, the optics was... Okay. <laughs> <laughs> the optics... Who, who was this girl? Corinne Cordero. Okay. So she eventually recruited... I think I remember Corinne. Yeah, yeah and Corinne. And then her older sister, Leslie, <coughs> was the president of the student council. Mm -hmm. In fact, I was joking. So you're a student council counselor and your, your, your older sister is president. Oh, wow. A dynasty. <laughs> 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 My kind of thing. I'm just kidding. <laughs> so I got into Tingog and it exposed me and it really um, gave me a, a platform. But a lot of it was behind the scenes, and I, I like that. And so there were certain programs I was nominated to uh, by the school that cost me a uh, cum laude uh, distinction because uh, one, 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 one subject thought that I dropped it, even if, I, even if all of my plates were graded, simply because I was representing the school. Mm -hmm. So anyway, um, <coughs> when I... W I had a clear vision. I wanted to work. I, you know, I mapped my life out, but always cognizant that you know, of of the of the of all any and all possibilities that I could turn out to be, uh, you know, a different person. But I wanted my first ten years after college to be devoted to public to public sector to public life, in whatever capacity, whether it's government or media, so anything public. And then th my thirties would be for myself. I go back to myself, and that's when I try to enrich myself. Wow, wow. So uh, you, you had a path, a clear path for yourself. Yeah, you know why? Because m the first 10 years after... Where did that come from? Wh where did that that uh, uh, planning come from, Th that ability to plan come from at an early age? Because yeah. most people at that age don't have any plans. <laughs> no, be it, it was because one time I was asked in a student... Uh, no, it's a student award, a two outstanding leader award. Where do you see yourself 10 years from mm, now? Yeah, that's always the question, yeah. Yeah, so... And that's a that's a question people ask also in job interview yeah. interviews apparently. So w when I was asked that, I said, "Why stop in? <laughs> why stop with ten years? Mm. I'd like to map all these milestones okay. out." Okay. No? Okay. So the first ten years would be that public, public service. Public service. Why? Because you have the energy. So where did you where where did you start your public service life? Year one. Uh, no, that's why uh, I'm 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 uh, getting to that. No? Okay. <laughs> For me. I made that decision. However, way I didn't know exact the, the details, the nitty gritty of it all. But I really know that okay, for the first ten years I would do this. Uh, I'll try my best to find a, a work a job in government because why the first ten years? That's when your idealism is burning. That's when you you're a sponge. You take in everything. It's a good. It's a great foray into the real world. You know, uh, with shock and awe and a real you know a, a really major dose of reality check. And you have all the energy that comes with being young. So if there's a, if there's a, the risk of being burnt out, of being frustrated, for sure, I would be in a better position to uh, take it in than if I do it when I'm in my 30s or 40s. When, the you're, when you're less ideal, right? Less ideal and maybe the energy has waned. The physical energy yeah. and mental energy as well. All of that, no? And um, so he, this is a time when you're dreaming, you're still dreaming, you're excited to make your dreams come true. And I believe that uh, 
the, the reality check that working in government provides tempers your dreams no? or fuels them further. And it's a good balance. And then the 30s, I go back to myself and enriching myself, looking at retirement so that when I do go back, if I do go back to government service or public service or politics, if, if, if the opportunity presents itself, when I'm in my 40s, I've been in a very comfort, comfortable position okay. that it's basically philanthropy. Okay. You know, that it's a passion project now. You don't go to government to earn. It's not a job. It's philanthropy mm -hmm. because I'm already set for life. So that's that was your plan. That's my plan for for this. So I didn't plan further <coughs> mm -hmm. because for me, everything will take care of itself by that time because I have a supposedly by then I would have a business that works for me for my family, and then I have a career path which is more for passion, not for profit. So, but what? However far that goes. To my 60s, 70s, 80s, hopefully over a century, I want to be, I really want to be old. <laughs> then that's what it is. So going back, having that uh, clear vision uh, roadmap uh, for my life uh, in mind, I applied, I actually applied. I wrote my one and only application letter after graduation. It was written to, well, it was addressed to the president. So, Who was the president at the time? Gloria. Gloria. Yeah. Already Gloria. This was yes. post era. Post era. Okay. This was 2005, okay. 2006. So I said, okay, this I will only write one application letter because uh, that's how focused I was. I want to be in the youth commission because I had I had uh, exposure with the youth commission as a youth leader and I wanted to be in the commission. Now, was I qualified? Uh, wasn't I too young? I mean, those were my concerns, but I said, okay. What, what the, the heck? heck, yeah. So. I wrote a letter addressed to the president. I said, how do you write a letter to the president? <laughs> so I actually Googled. Okay. <laughs> I Googled the... Letters the, to a president. You know, just the <laughs> protocol, no? uh, you know, the, the format, etc. Uh, I Googled it just, just to be sure. Uh, I had that, put my CV, put, it, put everything together. And so you had no experience uh -huh. whatsoever in terms of... Uh, that was your first job, yeah? That was my first job. Okay. My experience... Was in school. Yeah, that, youth leader. Yeah, that was what I was bringing into the okay. table. That was my pitch. Uh, you know, I, I can do well because I am the the sector I wish to represent. Um, and so th there may be older people there, but at least there's one who it was an actual youth. Is <laughs> actual youth. So because and then so anyway, when I saw the president one time here, I handed her my really my letter. So you personally delivered the Huh. application letter and she said what is this it's a letter for you she said, oh, okay <laughs> with her book oh, okay and then she passes it oh, okay no. uh, I, I can visualize uh, and i can hear her say that <laughs> and then i thought okay what the hell and then this is my gap year i'm gonna volunteer i'm gonna travel i'm gonna you know i'm not gonna work i'm gonna finish binge watch the 10 seasons of friends <laughs> and that's what exactly what i did and then before you know it, it was around april of uh, 2005 uh just after graduation and then in june of 2005 i get a call from from the appointment no, from the office of the president the search committee telling me that i had topped the short list mm. so for me oh my gosh even that is enough because as a test case i already passed the test so i said i'm so i was over the moon i said okay okay and then they were asking for my nbi clearance because that's the last step. Yeah, making sure, man. Before they transmit, it's really part of the process. Yeah. Before they transmit, before the transmittal of my appointment paper, so I was gonna get appointed. And then what happened was, I there was a the politica, because there was an impeachment. So one go congressman asked for that position for his daughter. So it was given to her, not to me. So people were saying, so um, are you disappointed in GMA in the whole process now that? You top the shortlist, but na politika ka? Ko, a bit, but it wouldn't weigh me down. It's part of the reality. And besides, I supported GMA. I campaigned for her. I headed her her Team Gloria Youth here in the 2004 elections. We flew to Manila to defend the integrity of the Cebu votes when they were questioned by then, uh, by the late, the camp of the late FPJ. So, this is part of the whole thing. Um, I will not begrudge her for trying to protect her position because the attacks are coming from all fronts. I believe in her vision and that takes precedence over my own personal ambition. Mm -hmm. So I will not I will not get mad. So you never got appointed. It was I wasn't I wasn't appointed yet. And then 
without saying anything, they shortlisted me to, uh, for a different position. The thing is, for that position, the, the current at the time, uh, the, cur the, the one who was occupying the position at the time, uh, was a friend of mine. And she, I believe, did well. Uh, she was doing well. Okay. And na ma politika po siya. Mm. So I said, I because she, she was going to be replaced by you. No, and they want they just wanted to replace her. Okay. But I was, in since I topped the shortlist, okay. there's a good chance that I was, okay, going to replace her. Okay. But people just wanted to replace her. They were saying she was with the Liberal Party, just because she was in the same political party as Kiko Pangilinan. But I liked her. She was really good. Sel Aves is her name. So I said, you know what? Even if I'm, even if I top the shortlist. I'll write Malakanya and endorse you. Your reappointment. What position was this? Commissioner for Visayas of the Youth Commission. S but still in the youth. Yes, uh, yes, yes. So, I said, yeah, I'm gonna write, and and say thank you for <laughs> for for considering me again. But I am respectfully endorsing the reappointment of Miss Araceli S. Aves uh, as uh, Commissioner representing Visayas of the Youth Commission. So anyway, they didn't uh, entertain that. Na politika and it was since I s somehow said no, someone else was appointed. So that was the second. Within, a sp that was November 20, 2006. Within the same year? Yes. A short span of time, like three months? Yeah, sorry, 2005, November 2005. Later, in in January of 2006, oh six. Oh six. Uh, no, February, uh, there was a charter day. There was another position I was shortlisted for. It's commissioner at large. So it's, a bit higher because the scope is national. I was shortlisted for that. And nasunog na ko kaduha, Murad. Kaduha na, mm. you know, di pa asa. You know, it's the, sec the second time that I've been told. So I didn't really pay attention na. But I was invited to a Charter Day celebration in Malacanang sa Subo. Subo City Charter Day. So it was February 23, 24. And then the president was there. Apparently, governor, she was governor also at the time, Gar Gwen Garcia. I said, congratulations, Mike. I heard you were appointed. And go, oh, Titan, uh, I don't think that's uh, you know, verified. She said, no, but uh, this guy told me, I think he's making it up to carry favors with you because you know, I'm from Cebu. Hmm. And of course, you're supporting my appointment also. Fast forward, I, I, I saw GM, we saw GMA. Gwen, Governor Gwen said, ma'am, thank you for appointing Mike. And then GMA was. <laughs> <laughs> I appointed him before, but the impeachment happened. She was so forthright. Okay. But the impeachment happened. I know you're endorsed by uh, Cardinal Vidal, blah, 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 blah. But now, I don't know. So, you, but, you know, a lot of people are lobbying for your position. That's how, that's how she said. A lot of people. That's what she told Gwen. In front of me. Okay. A lot of people are lobbying for your position. And me, I'm super sarcastic philosopher. <laughs> I said, my position? Well, it hasn't been given to me yet <laughs> for, for, for it to be called my position. And GMA was like, like sarcastic. To okay. So I said to cut the, ano, to mom, by the way, you know, whatever it is, can I get a message from you for the thing of Carolinian party? So you're still active with the student uh, council at that time? And, until now. Okay. Every election I, I go back. Okay. So for 19, wait, 18 years now. Wow. Uh, every year. So anyway, I... I go, can you record it here? Sure. And then she says, on the phone? <laughs> <laughs> Not anymore. <laughs> and then she laughs, blah, blah, blah. And then there was one of those coup d'etats, one of those uh, uh, unrest, uh, times of unrest after, the weekend after. Was it the one with Trulianes? One of those, okay. yeah. Because in, the, in that hotel, Oak, Manila Hotel, Either right? Oakwood or Manila Pen, one of those. Okay. So people who were making sip sip were flocking to the palace, but I was here. So people are saying, why don't you fly to Manila? Because whoever is there, they'll get appointed. <laughs> whoever is there will get appointed. I mean, I mean, if you're not there, out of sight, out of mind. No? So anyway, Ding Dong Dante, who was eventually appointed by Noy Noy Aquino, and who is a friend, no? uh, who's been very helpful in uh, some of my projects, uh, at the time wanted also to be appointed to the same position. As you? Yes, to that position. The uh, youth at large. Yes, commissioner at large. So that the commissioners at that time brought him because they didn't know me so they brought Ding Dong it's perfectly understandable so they brought Ding Dong GMA said ah but I already have a commissioner he's from Cebu <laughs> and they called me go, really? <laughs> and then, then she appointed me and it was uh, you know tell us about the ride there in, in uh, the uh, commission at large 
Well, uh, for the youth. For How long was that uh, position? For like three years, I was there. W what, what did you do as commissioner at large for the youth? Policy making, basically, uh, uh, in, in the Philippines. So we helped shape the, the recommended policies to the president, the recommended policies to Congress. Give yeah, us give us the highlight of uh, of your uh, tenure as commissioner at large for the youth. I would say because uh, in my job as at la commissioner at large, I was mandated to represent the Philippines also in the UN and ASEAN. So, for example, uh, during the coordinating conference for the social cultural com com community uh, of the ASEAN in the ASEAN headquarters in Jakarta, I was asked to represent. It was really tokenism. You know, just wanted the young person there. So I was, again, the youngest. I was, what, 22? At that time. <laughs> yeah. And everyone was, they were ministers, assistant ministers. They were all old. And they were drafting the main outcome document for the the next ASEAN summit, which was the 12th ASEAN summit, incidentally held here in Cebu. And that was a very, that's a major, that was a major outcome document because it's a milestone document. There are only a few, Bali, the Bali Accord, uh, you know, um, there are a few milestone, like maybe four or five milestone documents in the ASEAN history. And this was one of them, the, the Cebu Declaration. So the, the name of Cebu is there, toward one caring and sharing community. So anyway, when I was looking at the draft, because we were finalizing the draft, there was not a single mention of youth. I think you're looking at the future and you don't ma make mention of the, who populates the future. It's the youth. So I, I, I spoke up, said, why, are you, why isn't there? I think uh, it behooves me. You know, I would be remiss of my duty here as a young person, representing not just the youth, but also government, if I didn't say anything. Why is the draft uh, lacking in any mention of of the youth so they gave me the task of drafting the provision <laughs> uh, and I would consider that a highlight since that's international policy so they included it fine-tuned it a bit further but I that uh, I think it's a third 13th provision but it's there mm -hmm. one of the provisions of the main outcome document which was what did it say that's the 13th just item. highlighting the role of young people and, 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 and basically engaging young people in this in the in ensuring the realization of the vision of an ASEAN community. So young people have to t uh, take part. Uh, and that's important because it's an out as an outcome document, it's a policy direction of ASEAN. That, that, uh, include, uh, you know, that provision being included there is important for all other policies and programs because then they can quote. You know, any other government, Philippines or any government in the ASEAN, now, when they when they create their programs for young people, and, and when they pass policies that affect young people, they can quote this because it's it provides for an impetus that uh, that that uh, young people should be cons uh, considered in any in all policy and programs relative to ASEAN twenty uh, community. Mike, uh, um, why is it that the youth is uh, uh, underestimated, especially in government? I don't see a lot of young people in uh, in uh, government. I don't, uh, you know, like the president is, most presidents, at least uh, in, the, in the Philippines and even in the United States and other parts of the world, they're relatively very old, right? And um, um, I'm kind of uh, curious why that is the case. Why aren't there more young people in government, Mike? It's just maybe a matter of, uh, it's like a glass ceiling for women. You know, if it's hard to, it's an old man's, it's like, you know, it's an old gentleman's but, but why is it an old man's world when in fact every single thing that uh, a, an there old are, person they, knows probably you know because everything is recorded, everything is in, in the palm of your hands in terms of, in terms of experience. Of course, you probably didn't experience what they had to go through, but you know, uh, and you probably read about it or knew about it. So are, I think it's case to case, uh, Jigs. Uh, it's, it has to do with opportunities that are available and then they're taken the ones that are occupying have not yet retired so it's hard to break into to that number one number two so it's like a gentleman's club of sorts yeah well number th yeah and then that's one number two it's sometimes who you know mm -hmm. uh so which basically relates to number one number three it doesn't really pay well i mean now it, they've standardized i mean they've rationalized the salary package so it's a bit more attractive but between working in the private sector and the government sector it's more supposedly more lucrative in the private sector it's easier it's, you don't have to face issues it's not for the f for the faint of heart no you have to have the the stomach for for it because uh the issues you face 
the intrigues, the politics, you know, office politics. There's a lot. So, um, why why make yourself? Why do that to yourself? So, so young people. Why make your life difficult, yeah. right? So it really depends. It, but I see a lot of young people now, and a l- more than during my time. <laughs> I'd like to think of myself as still young, but um, <laughs> when I was in government, it was it was. Uh, they would joke. Um, you know, cabinet secretary, secretary Joe, he's 12, always 12. <laughs> um, but now, when I look at the people in this government, there are a lot of young people also. Um, so you think that there are more young people now than there were like 10 oh, years ago? Oh, for sure, for sure, for sure. I was always the, ad, uh, the odd man out. You know, your mouth has gotten you into a lot of uh, trouble, right? And, and also a lot of uh, opportunities as well, because like you said, you're a very opinionated person, right, mm-hmm. Mike? And... Uh, there are so many things that you have said and you have done that has uh, co- created quite a stir all <laughs> over uh, the Philippines, if not all over the world. And uh, some of them have have, uh, have uh, been online and on social media and have become uh, uh, sort of like uh, viral of, of <laughs> in some way or another. If you had to pick three things, uh, three moments uh, in uh, the times that your mouth has gotten you into a lot of uh, trouble, whether it's a good thing or a bad thing, is up to you, but uh, give me a, at least maybe the, the top three things that you have done uh, that has gone viral, that has gone, uh, uh, that has lit up the internet, so to speak. Oh my gosh! Um, I, <laughs> what's your what's your top I three favorite? I don't really, I don't live in the past. I okay. don't like to dwell, but but, but uh, give, give us the the three. Or, or wait, before Facebook, actually, before Facebook, I left my position in government under GMA because of that. I wrote. An expose <laughs> because there were certain complaints against the youth commission. I don't like to talk about this because it's in the past and I don't want to rock the boat, you know. And uh, but please talk about it. We want <laughs> rocking the boat. So <laughs> give me Bonamir first. <laughs> uh, so I wrote a blog. So there was already social media. Yeah, but there was no Facebook. Okay, as we know it. Uh, maybe there was, but I wasn't on it. Okay. So I wrote a blog called "Confessions of the President's Youngest Appointee." Mm-hmm. And because it, I went through the process, tried to fi- you know tried to give copies to the president of complaints from different young so people. So what was the complaint about? No, it was just about how every how uh, the youth commission was being run. I was part of it, sure, but it was very difficult because of the politics and you know uh, politics of accommodation. It was patronage politics, of course, the worst kind. So, uh, so there, we only have a few programs, international programs, for example, and they would be rigged. Rigged is to in, benefit in what way? Rigged to benefit either my colleagues in the Youth Commission, which I found very cheap, because we only had very few international programs to give, or or rigged to favor their relatives or friends. But despite this, we would open the search, you know, based on false pretenses, and I found that to be not just wrong morally but mm-hmm. criminal. Mm-hmm. Uh, and it was just going on and on, and I couldn't stop it because I only have one. Vote. So you wrote that blog. What happened? So, but I secured the documents, gave it. Apparently, it didn't reach the president. So I felt compelled, and I wrote that blog. Now, in hindsight, okay, can I just contextualize? In hindsight, if I were in the same position now, I probably wouldn't do that. I'd probably find another way. That was me being young and being foolish. Mm-hmm. But I don't regret it. See, I don't regret that I did what I did. It has helped shape me. So what happened after the expose? Did it cost you your job? Did it cost me my job because w- my colleagues... Did heads roll at that time? Well, you use that word, no? But uh, in my expose, I said, if heads have to roll, even if it includes mine, mm. so be it. The Youth Commission deserves a clean slate. So meaning, remove all of us. That was my appeal. Because uh, it, the Youth Commission at the time is really suffering from a terrible lack of uh, uh, loss of confidence in, uh, from, from, from young people. So... That was my appeal. The thing is, Boy Abunda, a good friend of mine, I think it came out in the news, and then he wanted me to be in, in his show, Private Conversations. I remember that, yeah. Yeah, and it was live. It was my first live. And in fact, I think it was his first live interview because he, his, he wanted to experiment. He made me into a guinea pig. Okay, okay. And he was, I thought... Where, where was this? Where was this live interview? ABS, okay. ABS, private conversation. And then... He was ba- basically badgering me, like badgering a witness, like like the p- prosecution badgering a witness. Oh my God, I thought he was my friend. <laughs> no, but I like during know, during the interview. During the interview, okay. but I answered. I this was this was after you've already written the the blog. Maybe right? like uh, 
maybe a few weeks after. Okay. And did heads already roll? Were you still in that position? Or were you already? I was in that position, and you were still in in that. Maybe position. it was wrong, no, because it it now no Exacer hindsight, exacerbated the situation. In hindsight, not not only that exacerbated, but I don't think it's prudent to talk about. It's like to wash your dirty linen in public. Mm -hmm. So that's what I'm saying. No, now you wouldn't have done that. I'm a, I'm a lot older. I would recognize it. It was rather young and foolish. Yeah, reckless. <laughs> but at that time. And I don't regret that I did it because I went through that. It's because you're of, who you were at that time. Yeah, it's part of uh, my my growth, growth, right? My my leadership journey. So, I you know I did it for the right reasons. Okay, and that's number one. I, 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 but so, no, but probably the only one because you know I uh, after that I was replaced unceremoniously by GMA. By whom? By the president. Uh, by, um, replaced by whom? By by someone else. But as you didn't know. No, I know, I know him. But when when we were when we had our turnover, he couldn't look me in the eye. He said, "Is there a problem? Why can't you look at me in the eye?" <laughs> but anyway, later that it was September. I remember I was in in uh, in Baguio, incidentally with Mrs. Marcos, who's a grand aunt, and uh, you mean Imelda Marcos. Yes, yes, Mrs. Imelda. So I was with Auntie Melody, and someone from Malacanang called me. September eighth, the birthday of Mama Mary, uh, twenty oh twenty oh eight, no. So she, the, the mom of Alfred Vargas, she's the late uh, Ching Vargas. She was C uh, deputy executive secretary for finance. And then she said, Mike, you know, they're lobbying for, your, uh, for you to be removed. Uh, and I think they, parang they did a one, two, three on, on PGMA. Hindi niya alam na pinirmahan niya. What, he, what she signed is to replace you. I go, yeah, but can, I heard you're with Mrs. Marcos. Maybe if Mrs. Marcos calls the president, uh, they will not transmit the papers of the, the replacement. So, so I said, you know what? I said in my expose that I was ready to go if I had to roll. Unfortunately, she, the press, GMA feels that... You had to go. <laughs> that it was only I that needed to go. Okay. I will not tell Auntie Meldi to lobby on my behalf because then I would be eating my own words. No, so... No, but if that's I, I serve at the pleasure of the president. Actually, I had a fixed term, and it was cut short, uh, you know, f by a few months. So anyway, Lu after that, Luli Arroyo found out that that was that's what happened. She normally doesn't interfere, but she she basically raised hell and told some key officials there that, do you know what really happened? Blah blah blah. So I got a call. Later that month, last week of September, asking me to come to the palace, they wanted to reinstate me. Okay. I said, no, nah. I already moved back to Cebu. The damage has been done. And if I go back there, and they're still there, then there's no point. And then later on, I got another call around January of the following year, when the chairman was, when his term ended, if I wanted to be chairman. I said, then it looks like I benefited from my expose. So it's okay. Okay. I don't want so to. How, how's the uh, Youth Commission now? And then GMA apologized to me. Yes. Uh, fast forward to 2019. How's the Youth Commission now? I'm not sure. Is it better now? But I hope so. Than you uh, left it? I hope so. <laughs> okay, uh, so th that was one of the highlights of, uh, of uh, how your mouth got into you in, into a lot of trouble and the things that you've done <laughs> got into, into a lot of trouble. There was one thing that brought you to the floors of the Senate, uh, which I actually saw you on television, I, and I told my mom when I saw you on television, I know this guy. Oh, my gosh. Uh, so tell us about what happened to that. It had something to do with Senator Leila de Lima and you posting a photograph on, on, on social media. What the hell happened, Mike? Well, that was uh, – I wasn't really going to be there. Okay. Uh, then the day before, uh, the office of Senator Gordon uh, asked if I could arrange an interview with Thinking Pinoy, who is not very, is, I mean, he's a friend. We're not, we're maybe close acquaintances. So I said, y you know, I'm going to be in Manila. I'll ask him if we, I can bring him to the Senate. And let us talk about uh, certain issues. I said, okay, I'll, ar I'll arrange it. And, and since I'll, I'm in the area, I'll just drop by with him. So I went. Uh, and there was going to be the next day. There was a scheduled um, Senate hearing on fake news. I said might as well just watch and support, you know, certain friends who are who were invited as resource persons. So on our way out, thinking when I grabbed a, a piece of pizza, and I said I want rice. Let's eat. But he was still eating the pizza. And then we passed. We happened to pass by Laila Delima's office. 
And I said... In, in the Senate? In the Senate. And they put there the number of days she's been in detention. I think it's still there. It's like a reverse countdown. And at the time, it was two, two, two days in detention. The, uh, the, the people uh, behind Leila Glima put the the uh, the, uh, num- the countdown. So yeah, the office. Was it a digital countdown? or no, like it's a just a pa- piece paper, of paper? Yeah. Okay. So I said, hey, let's take a picture. So we gave, I gave my phone to the staff of Gordon. He took a, a, a couple of pictures. I did like this. Thinking Pinoy put the pizza on his mouth and dub. No? A thinking Pinoy is that. a person, right? He, it's RJ oh, Nieto. RJ Nieto. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so he did, he did that. And then dab, no? Dab, whatever, whatever you call it. He did this. Uh-huh. Yeah. And then I did this. I posted it with a matter-of-fact caption. Two okay. to two days in detention. Okay. And then, and then it went viral. <laughs> so that's it. The next day, I wasn't going. So I'm not a morning person. So it, the the hearing was like eight or nine or nine nine. So you were summoned? Nine, no, not yet. Nine thirty. I said mm, nine thirty, pala. And then nine a.m. I was still in in uh, in Makati. And I hadn't gone to the bathroom yet. <laughs> 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 and I don't like leaving, really. I mean, unless it's very urgent. I will not leave the house. So you don't the consider summon. the Senate summoning you urgent? No, they didn't summon me yet. Okay. Because I was just going to watch. Because I, ah, okay. I committed to them that I was going to come. So I said, mm. but I, I said I was going to come. So I so I went to the Senate without making banyo. And for some reason, miracle of miracles, there was no traffic from Makati to the Senate. I arrived. I was just five minutes late. Okay. And they had just finished the prayer. But the room, the Senate hall, the session hall, uh, that, that, that big uh, hearing hall, was packed as into the brim. And there was no place to sit anymore. And you imagine, the media was there because Moka Usum was there. Think, sorry, Thinking Pinoy was there. They were, they, Maria Reza was supposed to go, but she didn't. ABS was there. So the noisiest uh, people on social media, pro or anti, this government were there so if, you d- if there was like a designated survivor scenario <laughs> there <laughs> the Philipp- philippine internet the next day would be so quiet and peaceful <laughs> everybody, yeah, in everybody in the internet who's who in the internet was all there who's noisy okay and whatever so i positioned myself at the very back my back against the wall leaning because mm-hmm. i had no chair to sit on so i was like doing like this i was in a hoodie Sila Franco Mabanta, they were re- invited as resource persons. They were dressed to the nines. Franco was uh, in his suit. I think Tinky Pinoy was in a barong. And uh, there I was in a black hoodie, like a, like a high school <laughs> with, a, with a backpack, <laughs> like a high school student. So you're just leaning on the, on the Senate, the Havering Hall. And then suddenly. Unbeknownst to everyone that you were there. Yeah, and suddenly, uh, Kiko Pangilinan says, I mean, he speaks you know, with a microphone on. Is Mike Acevedo Lopez here? And I was like, that's me. And then the people who knew that I was at the back, they, they look at me. And then, and then everyone starts to look at, at me at the very back of that hall. And I was like, I'm here. <laughs> and then Grace Poe, my erstwhile friend. <laughs> erstwhile, because we're no longer friends. Um, Grace, Senator Grace Poe, who I worked with she was the chairman and I was in the MPRCB, in the board of the MPRCB. Grace Bo said, uh, BM, she calls me BM Lopez, board member. So she said, BM Lopez, have you been administered your oath? No, <laughs> I'm not wasn't invited. I'm just here to watch. Oh, maybe it's time that you be administered your oath. Please join us. So that was it. Mm-hmm. And basically, the. the did did uh, Kiko Pangilinan ask you any questions? What was that all about? I think Did it was Trillianes. Okay, Trillianes. Well, what was Trillianes' question to you? Should we apologize? Could come in, you know, say no, because... So can you justify what you did? It took a photograph of, of uh, Le- Leila de Lima's uh, office door and uh, you were sort of like mocking the uh, 220 do- uh, days uh, in, in prison or something like that, right? Uh, can, you, can you justify that? Well, okay. First of all, that hearing was on fake news. My post was not news. It wasn't presented as news. It was a post. And it wasn't fake. We didn't make it up. It was the office of the Lima that put that there. Uh, my caption was matter of fact, two, two, two days in detention, nothing more, nothing less. It was 
an exercise of my freedom to express right or wrong bastos or not but you know what this is a democracy interestingly the people who assailed me or thinking tinoy at that time are so the supposed vanguards of democracy of freedom of expression so how is it that it's okay for them to express and to exercise or enjoy their rights to the hilt but i cannot if it if it uh if it contradicts their politics that's not fair that's a one-sided uh democracy so if you think it's bastos well i don't like senator dilima she was on my show open mic props to her because uh she took the risk maybe she really wanted to win that bad even if she knew that uh, i'm a critic she went there but i respected her i asked her the hard questions but i respected her but you know like I don't know if it was him thinking Pinoy or, or me who said, but we're happy that she's there. Why would we apologize? Is it wrong to say that you're happy? You know what? What she did to Gloria Arroyo when she forbade her from leaving the country, which the UN already said, no? Uh, that relevant UN uh, body. It was, was inhumane, yeah. Not just that. It was arbitrary, illegal, a violation of GMA's basic human rights, and a violation of international law. Those are the four points that the UN body, the, the relevant UN body said as regards um, not just the forbidding her to leave, no? to seek medical attention overseas, which is her right because she had no case at the time. It was a uh, violative of her rights and a violation of international law. So, um, so now the tables are turned. So, ako, I believe in the law, the karmic laws of the universe. I really believe in that. So, what she did to her, you know, you reap what you sow. And when, when, when you see that karma manifests itself no, and comes to collect, how can you not feel happy? I'm just honestly happy. Mm -hmm. You know what? And then, like recently, when her mom was ailing. The mom of uh, Layla. Layla. My heart goes out to her. No one deserves, you know, to see her mother ailing. But, and I hope that she was given a furlough to visit her mom. But I hope she also remembers what she did to GMA when GMA's grandson died. GMA doesn't make a spectacle out of things. She's not an Aquino given to public uh, hysterics no? or dramatics, histrionics, if you will. Uh, every time someone dies in their family and they, they milk the death you know, till there's nothing left and they will try to benefit from it politically. But GMA, GMA's grandson, the, the son of Luli, died of cardiomyopathy. He was, a one, he was an infant, he was one year old. But you never heard the Arroyos or GMA cry and, and, and gain, try to gain public sympathy or use the death of a loved one to, to advance whatever cause. So they were very quiet. And you know what Laila Dilima did when she was DOJ secretary? Um, the prosecutors, they're under, they, they just do, you know, as the secretary. They will not do that on their own. So GMA had a third, she was able to go no, uh, for like 30 minutes to visit her grandson. So she asked for a longer furlough so that she can go to the wake. You know what the prosecution did at the time? They tried to stop it. And you know what their argument was? She already had time. She was given time immediately when, when, she, when he died. And 30 minutes is enough time to grieve. Isn't that bullshit? Mm -hmm. So now, now that it's happening to Laila Dilima, how can, how, can, how can the idea of karma escape you? Especially that that's what she did to GMA. Now it's happening to her. How can how can you not see that as karma? So no? that's what uh, that's how you justify what you did. Uh, no, no, no. But in, this is in, in the Senate. In right? the Senate, now I don't even have to explain myself. But yeah. since we were made yeah. to explain yeah. ourselves, so is that what you told them? Well, this is the 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 the, the, the mom of Lila. This okay. is recent, no. Okay. I'm just uh, belaboring my point now. Mm -hmm. She, for me, I'm happy that karma has come to collect. I'm not happy that her mom is ailing. I hope they gave her. For me, for me, Mangod, we don't have to do to them what they do, they've done to us. But now that it's happening to her, I hope she has time to reflect on the impact of what she did before. But at the time, going back, I post. It generated buzz. It is what it is. You know, Mike, you mentioned that you're, uh, uh, what did you say, a socialist uh, democrat or, or, or something. More centrist. Centrist yeah. and all that stuff. You mentioned your political uh, views, your political sensibilities. But I'm very flexible. Well, well, uh, when, you were, when you were in college and all that stuff. 
but the problem with with Philippine politics is it's really a politics based. of personality, not a person uh, a politics of of ideology or beliefs. In fact, you don't know what the hell this guy believes in and what the other guy believes, and you don't you don't like them for what they believe in. You just like them for who they are, right? It, it's kind of a um, crazy and and difficult to choose amongst uh, candidates, right? Mm -hmm. um, do you think things will ever change, or has it changed now in 2019? Do we have uh, uh, people with ideologies, with beliefs uh, that are part and parcel of who they are, and in fact you kind of distinguish them from their ideologies or, and their beliefs, that you like them for that and not for how cute they are or how uh, sexy they are or, or how uh, they speak and all that stuff, those uh, other uh, inconsequential things of uh, when, when it comes to running an entire country? Well, uh, I think we have changed a bit. Okay. Social media, for better or for worse, has contributed to that. Uh, hopefully, there's uh, maybe you want to stay close to the microphone. Uh, intelligent yeah. discourse. Okay. Um, so do do we have a candidates now who have ideologies, uh, who have beliefs that are strong? And I uh, can't I can't say for sure okay. because there's always that risk. There's always a uh, the risk that we might fall into the same trap. Like Isco Moreno does this, and suddenly cult of personality is being developed again okay but i think it's been nipped in the bud uh he was speaking too soon if he if he has an intention to run for office higher office in the next uh election cycle uh i could see that there is uh, he has to he still has to prove himself so you see he has to be able to sustain no, whatever he does in manila the thing is um well what do you mean by sustain 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 the interest no 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 sustain what he's if he says that he's uh for good governance and political will, that that his leadership is exemplif you know, okay. uh, is ex uh, is characterized by political will. So do we ha do we have personalities that are like that who have like political that, personalities that have ideologies and beliefs no, that are right. strong? Okay, for example, uh, Isco, people are were impressed in his first week in office, first few weeks, but there is no clear ideology. But at least. If good governance and it's an ideology, <laughs> it could be. <laughs> it can't be. It can't be an ideology because it has to be in both the left and the right. So don't, we're not yet separated. Wala, wala. But 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 there's a risk again, no? Even Duterte, I supported him, but I will admit, he is a product of this mindset, of this cultural mindset that's oh. personality based. Yeah, exactly. And maybe it has to do with our culture. I just wager a guess. I'm not a sociologist or an anthropologist, but maybe because we're a, somehow a damaged culture, and maybe our genetic memory. Damaged uh, culture. What do you mean? Uh, well, we were subdued many times. We by, really our don't conquest, our, by our conquerors, right? We really don't. We have. <laughs> we're facing some some sort of an identity issues. crisis. We have issues. Yeah. So as a people. Yeah. Like this, huh? uh In 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 the internet, we we rara Duterte when he fucks you, fuck you. Uh -huh. He says fuck you to the United uh -huh. States. I'm oh, sorry. It's okay. It's alright. So this is the internet. You I, can do whatever. Yeah. So he, we, you know, the supporters rara. Okay. Yet the, these are the same supporters who are still colonial minded to an extent. Mm -hmm. We, we still have the American dream, you know. Um, so there's a duality there. And then we were subdued by this by Spain. Our being Catholic is part of that. And our folk Catholicism, our Catholicism is different from the Catholic of the Western world. Yes, Catholicism. Sir. It's part of, it's really, our culture is ingrained there. And somehow our real nature fights all these uh, imported ideas. But the imported ideas have also become inextricably part of who we are, and and I think it's not just a duality. No, there's some <laughs> multiple multiple personality disorder. We become we become kind of culturally schizophrenic. No, so like I say, I'm wagering a guess. I you know the the sociologist political schizophrenia. It, interesting or social or okay. social schizophrenia. Okay. because what are we really cultural? Schizophrenia. So you're saying uh, you're saying we're not either conservative or or liberal. We don't we don't. No, we well, don't for example, I'll, I'll, as a I'll admit something. I'm I'm pro democracy, but deep in my heart, I'm a royalist. I'm a monarchist. A monarchist. Yeah, divine right to rule. <laughs> you know, look at look at the look at the countries that have kings and queens that have yeah, the ones that have uh, moderated no their existence so that. Their existence is more justified, not like the opulent uh, kings and queens of the past, like England. Okay. Buckingham is practically a house. It's okay. not big. Uh, the king of Thailand. In times of political, social, uh, civil unrest, it's the monarch that, that is the glue you know, that holds everything together. And there's no politics there. There's no. It's just a birthright. It's like we agree. It's like that. So p some people don't like it, but this is my politics. Okay. I like it. That's why I love the queen okay. because she's so 
uh, so she, who would who would be the king li- and the queen in the Philippines? Well, <laughs> <laughs> lives up. She lives up to the ideal of what a queen ought to be, what a, a head of state ought to be. But w- why am I bringing up monarchy? I'm not saying that we should revert to that. It's just that our this this cult of personality, I believe, speaking of genetic memory, has something to do with our pre-colonial and colonial past. Our pre-colonial roots were m- royalist. We had Raja, Raja Humabon, Queen Juana. There were Datus. There was there was Sultan Kudarat. You know, these are our pre-colonial uh, past was really royal, and then our colonial 400. Uh, Our, our colonial history experience with colonialism under Spain, under Spanish rule for 400 years was also under a crown. Okay. So that's deeply ingrained in our genetic, in our genetics and in our genes. That's genetic memory. So somehow, when you look at the Philippines now with American uh, brand, the American brand of democracy imported here when during the American time. And we're, that's that's basically our, our type of uh, government, our kind of poli- a brand of politics. In fact, I think we got our constitution from the, the United yeah. States, right? We sort of like copy-pasted it. And, and just executive yeah. legislatures, a judiciary, it's not exactly the same because they have states, they have the electoral college, which is a bunch of bullshit. Kind of messed up, yeah. Yeah, but, but basically, similar. in a sense, it's similar. Uh, in fact, I see uh, American and Philippine politics sort of uh, predicting each other. Correct. You know, like you almost see uh, a certain sort of pattern, right? Correct. I mean, Duterte and then and, and Trump. And there was a time... That similar, but I would say they're very different. S- similar, but uh, I think they ascended to power in I similar think, ways. Yeah. yeah. But I think it's a worldwide phenomenon also. Yes. Um, but Because I think uh, th- the internet is, is such a galvanizing force that everybody, in a way, sort of like thinks uh, like everybody else now these days, that we are so interconnected. No, I think it's just the natural uh, order of things. You know, it's corrective measure. It's like uh, when there's overpopulation, some uh, disease will... Will wipe us out. Will wipe out a significant <laughs> number. Okay. It's like self-preservation. Yeah. And I think the human race is the same. If it we, if we lean toward the left for too long, our right rightist leaders will um, emerge and people will get tired of this and then they gravitate here. And at some point, it, it's just how it is. Self-correcting. Is that what you're saying? Yeah, something like that. So you think uh, that? Uh, uh, don't you find it interesting, Jigs? That very everywhere. Very interesting. Actually, yeah. actually, very interesting. Uh, Trump, uh, 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 Johnson, and and Duterte, of course, uh, and several other world yes. leaders are have a similar mold, right? So just when like this, ah, uh, I, I actually quite enjoy it. Yeah, I, actually, I do yeah. too. Uh, just when there is this movement, I don't know where it came from. Which movement? This unwritten movement of people being offended at everything. Yes, <laughs> you know, everything is offensive now. Uh-huh. Where you where you have where you go to the uh, which bathroom you you use, uh, what language you culture use. Culture of culture of outrage. Yeah, everything. You know, politics of of skin color. Mm. Everything is offensive. But just when this is uh, the norm, you know, uh, this is the zeit. It characterizes the zeitgeist. the zeitgeist of our time. You have these leaders offending purposely. <laughs> so it's really I like it. So parang it's. You know, these leaders are always on their toes because of the people who are so offended. And these people are offended, are offended more. I like it. I enjoy it. <laughs> It's funny, right? Now that you Lame mentioned it. Lame man kayo manungog. Yeah, yeah exactly. If dali kayo ma-offend ang tao, di ba? Pikon talo. Yeah, yeah. Ang taong pikon, masarap pikonin. So, I like that they're being, <laughs> you know, <laughs> riled up. <laughs> you know, one of the reasons why people are outraged about a lot of things is because the internet is such a, a cesspool of information. <laughs> cesspool, true. That um, if if you have a, a thought, if you have a belief, if you if you have a uh, a sort of like a strong belief about something, you just Google it, or just look search for it on the internet, and you'll you, an you, you will you will <laughs> see a group of people believing in the same things that you believe in, like-minded people. So it's easy to easier to find your tribe these days. Correct. But can I can I go back to uh, I was making my point on uh, being monarchist, okay, and mo- and monarchical roots. I think. Uh, <laughs> Let's say, say damage culture. Or maybe it's not. That's too strong a word, but that's why there's a cult. There's always this tendency for us Filipinos to want a cult of personality. Marcosian times. There's malakas in What did you say? Cult personality. Cult of personality. Okay. So Marcos, Marcosian times. Mm-hmm. The concept of malakas and maganda. They were practically king and queen, the Camelot of the Philippines. Yeah, but that was the the imagery that was conjured. And until now, you have loyalists, and I, I get to converse with them, and I listen. I just listen for my education. Uh, that they feel that they were like the king and queen of the Philippines, and that's why that's where their loyalty uh, is anchored on. And then after that, you have a you have Cory Aquino. She was basically 
the, the, the replacing royalty and Chris Aquino was this princess, spoiled brat mm-hmm. princess, mm-hmm. whatever. And you have, you know, it's always that. And and GMA is the the, gra- the daughter of a former president. And then you look at the 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 the, the countryside, and it's replete with um, feudalism. You know, our feudalistic past is still there. Hasn't escaped us yet. Yeah, it's changed. Uh, it's morphed into something else, maybe a different animal. But you can, it's still recognizable. Mm-hmm. It's still the same family names, and people vote for them. The same family names, they, the dynasties are perpetu- perpetuated, maybe because of money, but at the same time, si yun ang kilala eh. May, I'm, what I'm saying is, um, and I could be wrong, is that maybe it's because it's g- ingrained in our genetic memory that we gravitate toward kings, queens, dynasties. These are very royal concepts in spite of our democracy. You know, you, you can actually pass on a, a psychological uh, gene like Correct. that. Correct. It's not just physical genes, but also psychological yeah, like for genes. For example, my being gay, I know, is genetic. Mm-hmm. My dad's brother is gay. I have a cousin who's gay, another one who's lesbian. So for sure, it's genetic. So uh, which brings us to our next topic, uh, Mike. <laughs> um, you're, you're an openly gay uh, Roman Catholic, right? Openly gay, but, you know, I'm not, I don't fuss about it. Yes, of course. I'm not like a rah-rah. You know? Yeah, yeah, but... Um, uh, the uh, literal interpretation of, of uh, the Roman Catholic or, or the Christian Bible um, uh, explicitly says that you know um, there's no such thing as gay or, or being gay is is a sin and all that stuff. How do you how do you sort of uh, um, make th- these two contradicting uh, forces? Uh, and how do you uh, f- find? I yourself? find comfort in my contradictions, okay. Jigs. You know. Um, there's always the Hegelian dialectic, no? Mm-hmm. Thesis, antithesis, synthesis. I always like to quote that when there is some co- some form of conflict, whether it's between people or my personal values and ideas, I like that because thesis, antithesis, and then you have synthesis. Okay, so you and like then, that? So, so I, I, I like that there's that tug of war in, in me. So it's my feelings are not So how, how, how do you how does, that, how does that tug of war in your mind play out? And and when and uh, when you express your your beliefs about about being gay and also being Catholic at the same well, time, uh, it's sort of like a contradiction. It, it, well, basically, not really, because uh, th- well, this Pope has made it uh, what you call this. Um, he, he's a game changer. This Pope is a game yes, changer. Yes, of course. So. Yeah. So, but for me, uh, first of all, I don't like to talk about. Normally, I don't talk about my religion. Uh, I think uh, some people are turned off by by that and but why I, not you no, know the, the no, when people ask i answer yeah of course yeah. but uh, it's i think it's a very private thing um but it, it is your operating system your religion is who you are true, but you operate and you go out and get out of the world and do what you do and say what you say because of yeah, that That's yeah, but you, yeah. i don't have to explain it to people okay. unless they're interested and I, they want to i know. am interested yeah. mike so but i'm just <laughs> setting setting the record straight uh that for example on social media some people think i'm completely agnostic just because maybe that's the that's the perception the perception yeah. but i'm quite devout i just don't post it because i think that's very private it's the bible you know, do not let your left, left hand know what your right hand is doing when you give for, for me giving is like religion you know you don't broadcast it you broadcast your opinions maybe but not that but uh, now that you're asking uh my being okay i mean in fact a thai tv show flew all the way uh to interview me on the topic a few years ago. Uh, I'm sure you said no and you said yes to this. No, this is several <laughs> years ago. This is before I said no. Okay. <laughs> and maybe that's why I said no. <laughs> no. Um, I. Am I, are you going to regret answering this question or not? It depends on the public. <laughs> well, if there's a backlash or I, something. <laughs> let's find out. Um, but, okay. M- m- for me, m- m- the most important to me, the both aspects of, of, of my life are important. But if I have to choose... I would choose my religion or my faith. I'm not really religion, religion, but my faith. I, I grew up with it. It has helped me weather the toughest of times. It, it, it defines me more. I'm, more. I'm a Catholic more than I'm gay. Because I'm only gay the time when I'm attracted to a guy. Mm. I'm not attracted to a guy 24-7. Diba? I'm, I've been celibate for eight years. I mean, technically. Technically celibate. <laughs> technically. 
Would, Strictly. Would you like to explain what technically means? I'm not chaste. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, I mean, no penetrative uh, okay, action. Okay, all right. All right. <laughs> <laughs> you're, I think you're, you're using the Bill Clinton escape here. <laughs> no, but, no, strictly speaking, okay. yeah. But not that there weren't any... The, there were occasions uh, f- where temptation was there. But, you know, I just resist. I will only uh, accede if there is love, there is a, it's within a relationship. I'm very traditional that way. Mm-hmm. But this is just me. I don't think impose it on other people. I don't say, oh, you're promiscuous, look at me. No, 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 nothing like that. Go, do whatever makes you happy. This makes me happy. Having some restraint and self-control uh, makes me happy. But but when I'm in a relationship, oh my God, this is the most sexual person ever. <laughs> you know. But going back, my faith is more important to me because uh, like I said, no, it has helped me weather so many storms. Every time I have a dream, an aspiration, I lift it up and somehow heaven answers. And the biggest blessing for me is because of faith, uh, I'm able to understand why things don't work out don't don't always work out so for me the wisdom is the biggest blessing that your prayers are answered yes but that you understand why sometimes your prayers are unanswered and 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 i think this is part most of it is my faith it has nothing to do with my gender or my gender preference or identity whatever that is and for me faith is eternal if what i believe in really is the truth only time will tell when we all die no one can report back. No one can debate, really. I mean, you know, this is a pointless. It's, we can discuss, but no one will be proven correct. No, nobody, until nobody can report from death and tell no. everybody, hey, there's a heaven, correct. I see it, it's called. Yeah, and, and even, those so, who've, even those who've come back from. So, Mike, they say that being gay is a social construct. It's not, it, you know, we're, there's only male and female. And gay is just a social construct that we develop all through the years. Uh, but really, there's only male and female. What are your thoughts on that? There's, p- people have complicated things so much. I'm just a boy <laughs> who likes other boys. <laughs> a boy who likes other boys. I tried with girls. <laughs> I didn't like them that much. <laughs> That's it. I don't want to complicate it. Okay. M- you know, life is complicated. There, there are as 72 it is. gender uh, uh, associations. I didn't right? even know that. On on on. I think on, it's on Facebook, right? So um, uh, there's an actually it's an entire spectrum of of sexual orientation. So it is already complicated. Uh, I, I don't have to master it okay. to be able to live my life uh, the way I see it fit. No, mm-hmm. I would live my life. For me, I have a very, very simple rule of thumb. Which is? Just live your life according to what you believe is right and don't step on other people's toes. W- where does what you believe is right come from? Because sometimes what right... No, it's really well, a, a, but what right now is uh, could be wrong tomorrow. That's the, that's the thing. No, there are there are truths. There are eternal truths. Like, give me one internal. With good manners. Good manners. Okay. <laughs> you, know, you just don't. But th- there are different manners now and how to uh, behave. I think on being social... considerate. I think you just have to be considerate okay. of other people. Don't impose your values. That's what I learned. You know, uh, before and 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 during the time when I when I would visit GMA in detention, and she really taught me. Uh, she f- basically fine tuned what I had in mind already about. Idealism versus pragmatism. Let's go back to the gay, uh, okay, of course, yeah. the gay discourse <laughs> later, um, and the, and Catholicism. But uh, when I would visit Jamie, I would visit her in, in detention, in prison, in, in detention, detention yeah, okay. yeah, in in hospital, uh, in veterans medical center. I would visit her every month for like five years, almost every month, and we would have like Tuesdays with Maury, you know, and and there I saw that she was never, maybe in in her heart she was mad. Of course, who wouldn't be? But she would she would restrain herself from bad mouthing her successor, despite what you know, despite the fate that has befallen. Excuse me, her. I like that. I felt it was classy, dignified. It was grace personified. She would just roll her eyes, and even when I would bad mouth Noi Noi, this of all people, she should be the one bad mouthing. But she would just resist the urge to comment. And then, anyway, one time I was telling her, you know what, ma'am? And we were talking about what I just told you about uh, when she replaced me. And I told her, ma'am, you know what? I will always be grateful to you because after I left your government and you looked, you were looking for me in Cebu and I flew to Manila on May, in, it was May 2009. You said, you, she called for me and she said, you know, I called you here, Mike, because I wanted to clear the air. I think an inju- I believe an injustice was done you. She, you know, you up, 
I don't know if you remember, but you apologized. And I was a 24-year-old. Nobody. It's practically jobless. A bum. I was neither a billionaire with millions to contribute to your campaign, Kitty, nor a congressman with an impeachment vote to trade. Yet you gave me the time of day, the dignity of an apology. A nobody from the most powerful person in the country. Without the cameras, and you called me to apologize. Clear the air. That's just not ancient. So you know what, Mike? You were very idealistic. And that's good. But you just have to temper your idealism. And then, I, and then my response was, but you know what, ma'am? You're quite pragmatic. Some people say Machiavellian. The end justifies the means. However, there were times when you were also very idealistic. So what do you mean? This, this story, before she was uncomfortable about this story, later on, just recently, but I was the first to raise it with her. And now, she openly talks about it. That the worst times of her presidency started, actually. Remember World Trade Center, September 11, the Twin Towers. 9-1-1. Yeah. And uh, George W. Bush, after that, launched his war on terror. Remember? It's a war on terror. And then there was a coalition of the willing. The Philippines was the first country to join, being the, the volunteer, being the ally in the Far East. So we were the first to join the coalition of the willing. But some, at some point during all of this, somehow, very seamlessly, it became a war in Iraq. So from Osama bin Laden, suddenly it was, it was uh, Saddam Hussein. And the world didn't even notice that the war somehow changed and the villain changed. And the goal was the weapons of mass destruction now in Iraq, which proved to be... Not there. Yeah, not <laughs> there. So anyway, there was a truck driver there because part of our... A truck driver where? In, in Iraq. Okay. Filipino. Because part of our commitment to, to the coalition was manpower complement. We don't have the artillery. We don't have you know, military might. So it was manpower complement. So we had construction workers, truck drivers there. One of them was Angelo de la Cruz, and he was uh, abducted. He was abducted. So that's why later on, for many years, until maybe 2012, our passports, if you remember, had a stamp not valid for travel in Iraq. It was because of that incident. So anyway, Angelo de la Cruz was uh, abducted, and the, the, abducti the, the abductors demanded that the only way that he would be released if the, is if the Philippines pulled out from the coalition. Otherwise, they would behead him. So I was telling Jimmy, you know what, mom, you were very idealistic then. So why do you say that? So because you are the daughter of a former president. You are not naive. You studied in, in Georgetown. You were classmates with an American president, Bill Clinton. You know for a fact, as with those who are at least politically aware, uh, no, no, no. You know for a fact that no Philippine president will will succeed without American support. Marcos was not ousted because of pe people power. That was it contributed. No, the Americans had to extract him. Correct, and they told him he was going to Hawaii, but they brought him to Hawaii. Hawaii. <laughs> so it was basically a kidnapping. <laughs> so, but because the Americans pulled out the support, so you know that you're a student of politics. You grew up in this environment, yet. You risked angering America because you pulled out the troop, the troops, or our people. You pulled out the Philippines from the coalition of the willing to save that one life. That's pretty idealistic. Because if I were in your situ shoes, maybe lang, <laughs> I would probably say, oh, it's collateral damage. Uh, so idealism is not just a uh, feature of, of youth, right? I mean, like, is, is it possible for somebody to be ideal until his or her deathbed? Because No, that's why. That's th what I'm saying. Th this is what I told uh, some of my political uh, guests here. I've always told them, you know, especially, especially if you're, they're new in politics, mm -hmm. I've always told them, I'm scared that, you know, you're, you're, you're so ideal now, but when you get into politics, you know, you, the system swallows you whole, and it's either you uh, become them or, uh, you know, you, 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 you stop, you quit uh, the... the, the, the you quit moving forward into politics. So I'm scared of that. I'm scared of, of idealism disappearing if you get in, into politics. Is it possible to retain idealism, Mike? Well, that's why uh, that example I gave, this is a seasoned politician who in, was still ideal. in various moments during her presidency 
and when the the, the, di- the decision making was just impossible uh, she, was she, like, she yeah. made a judgment call that did not benefit at all her presidency but benefited that person and the reason there there is she was always she always loved the OFWs during her time the OFWs were welcome you know they had carolers in so, in, in in the airport when they would come home um, it was the least she could do to save that one person's life and you know what after that was the worst years were the worst years of her presidency and you know um, I think uh, who but anyway um, so, so, so idealism Mike um, is it possible to retain your idealism uh, at a later stage in your political career okay. for example so like her it, advice was this um, I mean, it's almost impossible no. to succeed in politics if you don't have a lot of no. compromise, right? No. Because politics True. is a bunch of compromise. True, and maybe this is a compromise. But what she thought, what she, what she actually told me was something that I held onto, and I mentioned this earlier. And she said it, in a, you know, she, she she had a better way of saying it. She said, "You know what, Mike? You were very idealistic. Just keep the idealism. Just make sure that you don't impose it onto other people, because the moment you do, you become proud." You become frustrated, and you become holier than thou. All of that just makes you not a better person. So, do your best. Do what's right in your sphere of influence. Then pick your battles. So that's how you use your idealism. You compartmentalize it. So, don't expect it from everyone else. Because she says, because what is right, really? Your version of right? So who are you to say that you are the arbiter of right and wrong? Even the church sometimes is criticized for faltering and they're a moral authority supposedly. So suddenly, you fashion yourself as uh, righteous, or super righteous that you get to say, who are you? Who, are, who am I? You ask yourself, who am I to say that I'm holier than thou? That I should be the one telling people what to do and what is right and what is wrong. Okay. Just do what is right. Don't, you know, as much as possible, don't hurt people along the way. As much as possible. Because sometimes you inadvertently, unwittingly hurt people. When you do and you see it, apologize. You know, cut yourself some slack. But, and then she says, because sometimes you're given an opportunity to serve, to lead. It is an opportunity that's not given everyone. So make the most of it. But you wouldn't want to be old when you're old and gray and you look back, no? For example, you became president. That you had a golden opportunity to better people's lives, to improve the economy, bite the bitter, uh, swallow the bitter pill and bite the bullet, to improve the economy, pass the, the needed reforms uh, so that we have a robust and resilient economy, improve the education sector, etc., etc. Do what needs to be done. But you weren't able to do it because you were so busy being right. So sometimes, that's why governance is really not for the faint of heart, for the sensitive people. Because really, compromises have to be made. And you have to be able to shelter yourself. And, and, and I guess what you're trying to say is it's not important if, if whether you're right or not. It's the greater it, good. What's important is doing the right thing at, at that time to accomplish whatever it is that you want to do, right? Focus on your sphere of influence okay. and do what's right as best as you can. And always the goal should be the greater good. So um, otherwise, she says you'll be a voice in the wilderness because you start pointing out that everyone is wrong. And then what? You're not able to do anything anymore because you've burned bridges. You've made enemies out of everyone you said isn't doing what's right. And then who's, who's supposed to help you? You're, you know, you can't do it by yourself. There's a government that needs to help you. There are The, the people need to support your vision. So you know, one of the things that's really crucial in being a successful politician uh, Mike is to have uh, the uh, financial backing, mm. uh, if not your own financial resources. And that's why I'm not running. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, w- one of the things that uh, politicians are yes. always associated with is the word corrupt, right? Mm-hmm. And uh, in fact, uh, th- they feel, um, well, most of them feel that it's a, it's a necessary mm-hmm. evil uh, that you need to uh, accumulate uh, money so that you can uh, run a respectable campaign and have a fighting chance of, of winning. What are your thoughts on the uh, relationship? Uh, of money and uh, politics and how it is inextricably uh, wound up together and you cannot have a, po- a, a, a legitimate political campaign without uh, financial backing Well, um, and corruption. I think two things. Uh, because the current milieu is really a, uh, culture, a culture of uh, 
personality, the cult of personality. Um, and the other one is um, the framework with which uh, where we where we all exist. Uh, f- the framework first is we need to really amend no, our campaign finance laws, uh, our party system, you know, uh, because this really breeds this kind Corruption, of reality. Yeah. Uh, the other one is for better or for worse, Duterte, Duterte no, uh, right or wrong, uh, we, it only you know only history can say if this if this six years given him will pro- will make the Philippines prosper or not, or retrogress, I don't know. But he, he is uh, proof that uh, you don't need so much money. But the internet is actually a game changer. I, I gave a presentation before in November 2015, uh, 14, campaigning in our generation. And he said, you know, the internet, everyone has a smartphone. It's democratized uh, all of these things, uh, and there, the next pre- the next president might be someone that Facebook elects. And like I said, for better or for worse, the point is you have a guy there who's not from the established elite of Manila. I think he's romanticized his his roots because the Duterte's from Cebu are really from Cebu. His dad was cabinet secretary. The Duterte's of Cebu, uh, the original ones in from here in Cebu City. The classified mestizo Espanol in the old census, They're, they were the creme de la creme of old Cebu. So rich, older in fact than the Aranetas or the Rojases. But they're not of the ruling elite families established in Manila. But still he was able to beat them. So so you're saying that Duterte didn't have the financial resources? No. Didn't he have did, the financial backing? He didn't have the resources. He turned, I've, I've seen him turn down, like really return, return and turn down some you know contributions from oligarchs. I personally saw him in the tens of millions, and that's why I like him. You know because I don't agree with everything. With the bra- you know, makatawa na lang ko. It's sad that maybe some people don't like it, but you know. But I have never seen a politician. Maybe there are, but I've never seen a politician refuse money like that. Uh, no. So this was, this was during uh, the campaign. The campaign. Yeah, you know, the lead up to the election. This, uh, the first time I saw him was uh, that, that he really refused su- super big amount uh, was December 4, 20, oh, 2015. So in Davao. And Maybe he just chooses his uh, campaign contributors. Probably. Contributors, yeah. Probably, but that's a start. No? Now, you have someone who at least has that kind of uh, dis- uh, discretion. No? Now, not, not from Lushatan or well, who, mm. you know, he chooses. Uh, those who probably won't ask for anything in return. Okay. Or maybe he sets the... I know, but I've never seen him accept. And there was one person who was insistent. I won't mention names. And he said, thank you. But why don't you just come up with sorties, t-shirts, okay. and I'll just attend. Mm-hmm. But don't give me the money. Okay. You know. So, um, so I say, that's very particular to him, to Duterte. But... Uh, it gives you hope that in this country, someone who's not from the ruling elite, from the ruling class of Metro Manila, of the Imperial Manila, can actually beat candidates from, from that very exclusive group, you know, and he beat them. So I just mentioned that because, meaning, it's not impossible. And it's become a reality now. Now, how do you institutionalize that? We go back to the framework, and that's campaign finance reform. But I guess uh, social media, the internet, is a great equalizer. Oh, for sure. In many ways, right? But the problem is, once uh, they know uh, that, once politicians know that it is uh, indeed a great equalizer, they're, they're also probably going to use it and pour their resources there Yeah, as that's well. why you, you can always, there's a game, a game that can be a game changer. Yeah. But then you study it, you, you let it uh, flourish a while, and then you study it, and then you can rig it. Yeah, exactly. And uh, you know that's the I, fake news uh, thing. Cambridge Analytica and, yeah. and uh, the Trump uh, presidency. It was very uh, controversial. In fact, uh, people are saying that it was really, you know, it, it was a, a foreign nation. The, the Russians. They blame it on the Russians, who uh, changed uh, the outcome of, of uh, uh, the elections mm-hmm. in, the, in the United States. In fact, uh, uh, there are some sources out there that, that are saying that. That uh, w- that's what also happened in the Philippines as well. Nobody's just talking about it. No, he's really widespread. I mean, I was going around, okay. and, and it was he still is extremely popular um, because he's very relatable. Very relatable. I think that's one of the 
key features whether of the whether it's authentic or it's all like uh, for show for show then it's a br- and then he's brilliant because <laughs> he, he knows alam niya kilite but you know the people who come that's why i really am so against this maria Ressa character mm-hmm. it's because she has tried to simplify the equation according to uh, what suits her argument the thing is the, the people the, the most passionate the ones she calls trolls they're really real people they're not paid i mean for example that's why i hate being called a blogger i'm i'm just i just have a facebook account mm. sometimes it goes viral i don't i know for some reason you know i'm not a blogger at all and and this allusion sometimes that hey we're paid excuse me some paling kita ng pera putang ina ka i mean diba okay it's very cheap I'm, so you know they're trying to say, like the cambridge analytica and and, and rigging you know uh, gaming the elections okay. through social media fake news uh, trolls yeah there are trolls but the most popular well i wouldn't say the most popular but mo- the not the most popular facebook personalities no not not them but the noisiest the real ones who just comment there sometimes uh, neither here nor there na ang comment the real people it's the OFWs you know the, the, the love for the man is really phenomenal I don't even I mean it's hard to understand and it's like Teflon whatever issue you throw it doesn't stick so I don't know why maybe because uh, they feel invested in him he is their candidate he's their guy uh, but in you know we're way past the midterm and his approval ratings are still so there's three more years uh, yeah, of, but, of, of the but 30, right? But we've never seen a president with approval ratings like his this late in the day. It's even in other countries that's that's really unheard of. Well, uh, most of the leaders in other countries are actually um, you know not as popular as he is. Yeah, yeah, and I, I think in history he, he would f- probably figure in the top uh, as uh, the most pop- one of the most popular leaders. So uh, in, in, at least in, in so their um, country. the uh, the. Um, do you agree with the way uh, he's is running this nation uh, midway into his uh, presidency? Uh, the uh, whole uh, um, drug uh, war thing. How's that? How's that working out? Is 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 uh, is that uh, uh, <laughs> moving back, moving this back country <laughs> forward? <laughs> let's go back to homosexuality <laughs> and religion. No, give, no. Uh, g- give us your take on the general I, trajectory of this nation and where he's leading it. I'm not an expert in the. In but just the, give us your your unexpert. Well, uh, uh, okay. Opinion. I continue to support the president. I continue to support the president. Uh, there are certain things that are, uh, I think, Im- needs improvement, uh, and or things that needed improvement then but have not been improved uh, that have not yet been improved until now. Um, that's it. Now, when it comes to the drug war, I'm not an expert. I like. Uh, I like. Uh, the authenticity he brings to the discourse uh, it's different at least for once in our nation's history in our in our lives uh, there is a kind of there's a, not a kind of a president who speaks like that it has to be at least one you know um, uh, others will be copycats if, if they try to mimic his style um, I like this build 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 vision uh, infrastructure is always key to trickling down the, all these GDP, you know, all these macroeconomic uh, figures that look so promising will not be felt by the by the people who need to feel them the most, if not for, if not for infrastructure. So I I'm completely in support of uh, the build build build. Um, so yeah, I I, I think uh, on the right track. Other things, some people I think in this government need to be replaced, but uh, overall I, I continue to support him. Uh, this whole social media thing is not only affecting uh, politics, but also the way in which we deal with each other, r- the way you know, our relationships are these days. You know, it, it, we have a totally different dynamic now. Mm-hmm. How do you think uh, a social media, aside from politics, has changed the way with each the day we uh, the day we the way we deal with each other as people? Mm, it's interesting. It's part of I think human evolution. You know that uh, we have online and offline uh, lives. Uh, we have an online and offline life. Do you have a different existence. online life really. and an offline life? Not really. Um, my my online presence is an extension of my offline existence, which is what is real. It's basically the same. What, what, you don't, what, you what, what don't you show online? Oh, there's a lot. 
that's why I say it's an extension. It's not really ref- completely reflective. Uh, it's not really completely reflective of it because I there are certain except you know my 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 practice of my faith. If I were in a relationship, I'd, you know, I mean, when I go out on dates, like the really important ones, I don't post it in my dinners and lunches where I basically. I like how Facebook archives things, so I have I painstakingly uh, organize them for my own pleasure, not for anyone else's. When I put the caption there, eighty percent of that is for me, so that when I, God forbid, <laughs> have Alzheimer's or whatever, okay, even if I don't remember it, oh really? So this happened, and there's a good caption there that describes what it was. So you know what? These people who have dementia now, they didn't have social media then. They have nothing to look at, maybe albums, but there's no caption. But now, it, you have a, an archive that's, that's made by you that has the date, the, the people there, tag, and you have... Your digital footprint, yeah, right? and you have your option to put uh, uh, like a good description. So, hopefully... If and I, you look back at it? If I do live to, you know... A hundred? A hundred. <laughs> maybe it's already downloaded to my brain. But anyway, that helps, you know? I'm just looking at, looking at things ahead. And now... Even when you're traveling, sometimes a conversation starter. You meet someone in the airport. Oh, you're from this country. You know what? I was there before. And you know what? There's this place I like. And there's this restaurant that, you know, that serves really good. What is it? Wait, hold on. And then Facebook helps you find it very quickly. Within a ma- just uh, the, the only data, the speed of your data is the, the, that o- that's the only one that spells the difference between finding it quickly or, or not. And then, Depends what country you're from, right? Yeah, in the Philippines, you'll get it tomorrow. Yeah, but at least it's still there. <laughs> and you show, this is it. And then, oh, I've been there. Blah, blah, blah. I know the owner. See, it's, it makes for a really good conversation because it's there in your archives. If it's a job opportunity or business opportunity, hey, you know what? I did that before. I'll show you. You don't have to carry a USB or a, or a laptop with you. It can be on your phone. I can show, oh, this is what I did in the UN. Oh, you were in the UN. I was, you know, I, I was I represented the Philippines in the 62nd General Assembly. Here, this is, this is my picture. There's proof. Immediately, you're legit. <laughs> you know, because these are people. These are people who don't know you from Adam, for example, from different cultures, different countries, and then they see there's proof. Yeah. That's not staged because there was no time to stage it because you just it's just a chance encounter, and then you have all of this. Uh, it it really opens a lot of doors. So I. Take it seriously, my archival. So I post it not for other people, just for my viewing pleasure. But when it comes to the dates that really matter, okay, like the people I really, really, really like, I upload them to an album that only I see. Okay, like a private album. It's super private, or only that person. Unless a hacker from Russia will hack it. Oh, I say that's uh, <laughs> that's deep faking. <laughs> that's deep fake. You know, you just edited it. But no, it really, um, uh. That's 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 me, and um, I I would like to say it's an extension. It's not completely reflective of me, uh, and sometimes. What are your thoughts on on uh, because you leave your digital footprints online? It is who you are partially mm-hmm. online, right? And um, Facebook and other social media outfits have taken advantage of the data, your footprint, and and have used they can that, have it. <laughs> uh, and they have used that uh, to, and in fact, have sold that perhaps. Uh, to other companies so that they can figure out how to make money off of you. I don't mind. I don't mind. Okay. I'm, I'm in. I'm in Facebook. I, I signed off on all of that. Okay. Uh, I, I click agree without reading the fine print. So. Okay. So it's I your fault. I waived my right. <laughs> so Why will I complain now? <laughs> Didn't we all a click accept or I agree? Exactly. Yeah. Some time ago, like yeah. ten years ago. Yeah. So. Why will I complain now, belated? And besides, I like being profiled. Okay. I mean, at least. If my behavior, my let's say consumer be as part of, I mean my my purchasing behavior or whatever consumer your behavior, viewing behavior yeah or even viewing or whatever it is is taken into account, then at least I'm represented or at least you know who you are yeah and then what the and then the market will cater to my needs, then suddenly the person who is so private will have nothing for him in the marketplace of ideas or in an actual marketplace. Because his data was not retrieved. Okay. I'd like for my taste, my preferences, my viewing or purchasing habits to be recorded. So at least. Are you the kind of person, Mike, that's online 24-7? Do you have time for yourself? Do you have time to unplug? Um, 
they're saying that some of the diseases of the new generation have, you know, were not there back then, and and I think they attribute some of those diseases, those uh, um, especially those mental conditions, uh, to the internet and how people are addicted to it. In fact, they're saying that the internet Wi-Fi is the new nicotine, is the new cigarette. What are your thoughts on being constantly online and uh, our con our addiction uh, to it? Well, uh, it's become part of our existing reality. I mean, people can rationalize it, conduct studies if they want to, and I'd be interested to read. But uh, I wouldn't be too conscious about, you know, what it does or what okay. it doesn't okay. do or whatever. I have my time to myself. Either I listen to music every day. It's mandatory. After my first meal. In I, the morning, you mean? <laughs> I don't wake up in the morning. Okay. But if I do wake up in the morning because I have an appointment, then I... I have to wake up a lot earlier because this has to be in my schedule. So, example, if I tomorrow I have a CPA meeting at 9, I have to wake up at 6. A.M.? Yes. Okay. So that I have enough time for my, my rituals. And my ritual is basic. basic uh, it's basically uh, <laughs> I eat. After that, I have my coffee with music. I just spend uh, the time to reflect. For that, and that last, I finish my coffee... It can last from one hour and a half to three hours. And there, no one disturbs me. Even my dad. The angel man. How are you doing, <laughs> sir? He, how is he doing, by the way? Oh, he's retired. Happy, <laughs> happy to be retired. <laughs> so, sometimes he, if it's really urgent, he knows. Okay. He knows to really... So, this is at home, right? At home. So, you, you like have an hour and a half for yourself having a cup at of coffee? At the very least. At the very minimum. With music, I read books. Sometimes I read from my phone, but... No calls, no nothing, no interaction, just me. Okay, Mike, um, let's uh, si uh, sidetrack to another subject matter. S the Sogi bill, everybody's talking about that. Yeah. Uh, everybody's talking about that, uh, and um, you, f you uh, have a position on that that you, you mentioned to me off the air during our cup of coffee at the dessert factory here in uh, Ramos. Tell us about what your position is on the Sogi bill. You know what? What um, are your thoughts on that? Uh, I have a friend. His name is Emil, and he's from New York. And he's lived there since 2006. He's basically a New Yorker. Um, and I would call him, fondly call him, jokingly, but, you know, more than half men. My greatest frustration. Because when we, when he was still in the Philippines, I liked him, and, you know, and, but I was in a relationship. So I, I never wanted to cheat, blah, blah, blah. So we were, were for me, I, I feel we're, we're star-crossed, you know. And now he's in a relationship, so we're just friends, blah, blah, blah. But anyway, he's very intelligent, Menza. And I guess his worldview is shaped now, has been shaped no? uh, by his life in New York. It's, it's a life-changing experience for him. So anyway, he was here, and I threw a dinner for him. I hosted a dinner for him with friends, never my friends. He's never met them, except for Eric. Um, and then after that, we had coffee after, after dinner with some of the people who stayed behind. And for some reason, the restroom issue was brought up. And then I said, you know what? I don't have a very strong opinion about it um, because I've never felt <coughs> discrimination. Maybe I've been discriminated against. I just didn't feel it. I'm like that sometimes. You know? so, or maybe I felt it, but I didn't let it dampen my spirits. Maybe I'm lucky. And then you know what? He whispers to me. He says, I'm rather disappointed that you don't have a stronger opinion on the issue. Because you have a voice, and you should use that voice to promote it. I was stunned at first. But the thing is, I don't. Why will you force me? Right? I mean, my reality is different. And it, it is in no way to... It, I, my reality in no way tries to uh, overrule other people's realities. They have that. I will not take that away from them. And that's why I respect the the voices of uh, support for the bill or dissent because those are coming from their own respective realities. But my reality is different. And I think if I were to hijack the cause, that would be epal. Epal ka lang. You can't relate so much and then suddenly I want to be a, a stronger, louder voice for something that I don't completely understand. I don't completely relate with. Now, I said, you know what? My, my, my role could be to ask questions, provocative questions, not supply answers. We don't have to supply the answer all the time. Sometimes our contribution is asking the right questions, with hard questions, 
hopefully people answer them truthfully and and compel others to action that's 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 the most that some of us can do sometimes but you can't expect me um because for me i respect and support and actually admire those who who fight for gay rights who join the pride march i've never joined one simply because my gender preference is something that's incidental to my existence it's just there i don't make a big fuss out of it not that it's wrong to make a fuss out of it it's just that for me i hope i'm given the chance to express this because everyone is about gung-ho about expression and respecting other people's preferences and, and I, gender identities so this is how i identify myself i identify myself as an incidentally gay person i exist for the purpose i charted for myself hopefully i'm living my life's purpose but i i don't let it define me Th- that's my choice other people they are defined by that and that's completely fine it's just that in me in, in, in my case it's just incidental to 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 my existence and that's why when you go back to that question you had about religion my faith is more constant if i falter i fall many times i don't live up to the expectation which is fine that's why when you say what is the but do i find con-? yes there is a contradiction there are s- certain stipulations there that i will not be able to live up to but i cut myself some slack and i know that the you know the god i believe in is a loving god i try to make certain sacrifices these are personal in no way do i impose them on other people as an offering bec- for for the many times that i failed so I falter and fail constantly, consistently, every single day. The times when I con- I make a conscious decision to deprive myself of something, I use it as an offering for the many other times. And then that will not be enough, but I like it. I like, I like that tug of war. I like being able to offer something, however small, a sacrifice that is. So my, my, my faith is concerned. Be- people, you can be agnostic, atheist, but I am a believer. So in my book, there is an uh, there is an afterlife so faith is eternal i believe in the afterlife so i'm and 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 being gay is physical so faith or, is or genetic right yeah fa- yeah but uh, my on here is faith is spiritual spiritual is eternal being gay is physical physical is temporal so both are important to me and they're part of who i am but if i have to choose I choose eternal. So, I may not be doing very good in that regard, but at least I'm trying. That's just where, that's how I try to manage and balance things. And and if I do, uh, let's say, they say it's not it's not the sinner, it's the sin. That's how the Judge church, the sin, not the sinner, yeah, right? Or something and, like that. And uh, it's not being gay, it's a sin. It's the homosexual act, or it's... Uh, adultery or or premarital it's it's across the board actually it's mm. it's not specific to being gay i mean they say it's a gay sex is as much a sin as heterosexual premarital sex okay. is okay so it's it's actually being made out to be more than what it is but and then you have a you have gay people who would say but but mike how can your expression of love be a sin i don't know there are certain questions i cannot answer i just live and at some point in the fullness of time i'll be able to get answers but it's okay to not know the answers and i just hope against all hope that that uh, when the time comes my choice to do to only do it to express to sexually express myself with the person i love not just with any tom dick and harry there with dick probably but <laughs> is uh is would be sufficient no but you know what? The wisdom of God is different, and we cannot we cannot contain it. We cannot even uh, attempt to interpret or speak for Him. I think that's presumptuous for some people to to preach as if they represent God. No one has spoken with Him. Since, exactly. Yeah. yeah. So, so Mike, I'm curious, where does this faith come from? Because you know this construct uh, or or whatever it is that we call God as as a people is 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 so difficult to prove, and you know like. It's a, it's a really long story, and uh, I'm curious, where do you get your faith? Where well, did it come from? Did it come from your parents? Is it genetic? Well, uh, my parents are devout, no? uh, and I like the fact that they have never been judged 
maybe they resist their judgment, but toward us. My my sister got pregnant out of wedlock, and they took it pretty well, you know. And how about you coming out? Was there like a moment when you came out and told them that you were gay? Was there like a moment? Did you come out? So no? that that uh, private conversations uh, <laughs> thing with Boyabunda. Okay. For me, because I don't have to explain myself. That's really my thing. Okay. I don't have to explain myself. But this was in two thousand and four. Uh, 2008, I think. So, sorry, it's 11 years ago. Okay, so anyway, so was that the day you came out? Uh, so for me, I would bring, uh, my, I have only have two exes, no? so I brought them home. So, you know, read between the lines. Okay, you know? so, oh, uh, with your mom and dad. Yeah, I would bring them to family gatherings and they would be fine, you know. Uh, they would be fine with my exes. So, they would, so they but would, you did announce that on, on national no, television, right? No, this is the thing. So it was gonna be live. So I, I agreed. No, I signed off on the live interview. I said, "Okay, sure, why not? It'd be fun. The energy would be different." The thing is, uh, like hours before, I said, "Oh my gosh, what if boy asks me if I'm gay?" <laughs> I cannot lie, okay. especially when you have nas- on national TV. I cannot lie. So I said, "Oh my gosh, my my mom is gonna be watching." So <laughs> I called your I, mom. I called her. Uh, I was in ABS outside the diner that was open at the time <laughs> now it's Starbucks um, I said ma she, oh so how is it gonna be blah, 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 blah. so is it gonna push through I go yeah yeah and she has all these questions and I'm gonna pray for you and said, oh, wait 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 wait. She, can I just say something she, oh yeah what is it what is it she, um, you know what if boy asks me if I'm gay I have to tell him the truth and she fell quiet and then she said why will he ask you that? That's a private thing. And he said, Ma, doesn't make, the show is called Private Conversations. <laughs> <laughs> she, and she says, you know, I don't think I'm ready to watch that, but you know, I'll, I'll pray for you. You mean she's not ready to watch that? You t- I, she, she said that. Anyway, boy didn't ask me. Okay. <laughs> so I went through the trouble. <laughs> um, <laughs> Much to do about nothing. Uh, yeah, anyway, so I went so, back to Cebu. So that was your first... Uh, Sort of coming out to your mom, right? Yeah. In a way. So I went back to Cebu the next day. It was a weekend. And then I dropped off my stuff. And then I was with my ex who spent some time. Uh, I think we were in a hotel. And then on Monday, I get a call from her. She said, oh, so how did it go? You didn't come home. I went. I came home. I left my stuff. But uh, I'm I'm with um, Bod. Uh-huh. And then she said, so how did it go? It goes okay. Did he ask you? Could, no, he didn't. So, Oh, that's good. Because like I said, it's private. It's kind of inappropriate. It was a different world back then. <laughs> this is pre the free travel. So I said, okay. And then she says, well, if you want to talk about it, I'm just here. I said, no, no, I'm fine. And then that's it. My dad is pretty cool with it because his brother's gay. So hmm. he would just tease sometimes. So what are you And then, yeah, he would talk to, like one time I was, there's this, straight guy I was very close with uh, but nothing nothing like that no? and he pulled him aside at my sister's wedding and he says he meaning your dad my dad my friend told me so you know your dad pulled me aside and then he said please take care of my son okay it was just <laughs> like that so that's why you know it's it's a different reality for me and and you know what like a boy Abunda is very passionate about it but because he, because he comes from a different time a different place a different experience and and that's valid no one no one no one's trying to take that away from him and because we talk about these things and ako, i'm okay with anything so for example there's us there's there's there's, there's this stigma that they say that um, some people are very passionate about uh, being gay when when they hear it being branded as a as a, as a, as a disorder they lose I mean, they completely lose it. It's wrong. I, for me, I don't mind. So, it's not a betrayal of, of the sector or or the cause. It's just for me, I don't mind because, well, we all we, we don't want any stigma about mental illness. But how is it that if it's considered, let's say, a mental illness, you lose, you go batshit crazy? Then you then, then you contribute to the stigma again of mental illness in general. If if it if there shouldn't be anything wrong with mental illness, why are you complaining if b- being gay is a mental illness? So, you know, you, you get what I mean. Yeah. So, so you I'm, contribute, to, you fan the flame, yeah, so to speak. But yeah. I don't mind. I don't think it is. But if it were, it's okay. I can have a mental disorder 
because most brilliant people have. <laughs> so crazy <laughs> is a compliment, right? <laughs> yeah, for sure. It's the crazy ones. That, it's, it's Change the world. Steve, Steve Jobs. Steve said Jobs. That. You know? It's the crazies, you know. <laughs> the, the round pegs and square, whatever. Yeah, yeah, round, yeah. yeah. So I don't think it is. But if it were, and then boy says, but there's no cure. Well, not all mental illnesses or diseases have cures. In fact, a, a lot of our modern diseases have no cure. They just have uh, ways to in which we can abate mm -hmm. it, but not really yeah, fully cure them, right? Yeah, like for example, um, you have Greta now. Who's Greta, yeah, yeah, yeah. Championing uh, uh, the climate, climate change, change yeah. uh, course, uh, cause, no? Well, she's uh, she's Asperger's. Yeah, yeah. And she's done a marvelous job in in in, in agitating people whichever side they are yeah, yeah. in this great uh, climate change divide. So it's completely fine to... Where are you in this whole uh, climate cha uh, cha change divide, uh, uh, Mike? Because uh, there's uh, the climate change deniers, deniers and then those the, those that believe in, in climate change, as Al Gore expressed it in The uh, Inconvenient, Inconvenient Truth. Truth. Yeah. Um, I've We're always been... Uh, my, my original advocacy has always been in environmental conservation. So, of course, I believe it. Just that, it's, I, I think, a little of both. It's a little of both. Um, uh, it's, part of it is the, nat the Earth's natural uh, cycle of warming up, you know. Um, but the carbon emissions don't help. So, I think it's really the way, I mean, it's really the, the inconvenient truth that we're headed. Uh, it's really a warmer uh, planet and we just have to adapt and mitigate its effects. But at the same time, it doesn't mean that we contribute to speeding it up. We have to slow it down a bit for our sakes because our adaptability uh, part of... Okay, so you, you don't think that we're contributing to... Uh, no, we're contributing to speeding up the... the climate change, yes. yes. Yeah. But yeah, Global warming, but, climate change. But, but doesn't mean what? No, no. So, doesn't mean that it's one or the other. It's both. I think it's both. The deniers say it's just the natural course of things. Because well, um, one of the things that the deniers believe in is that only uh, God can end the world and it can't be man-made. Those are the, what are the... No, no. The, well, if you, if you go by that argument... Yeah, those are what uh, they believe in, actually. No, I mean, I mean, if I were to indulge them in, yeah. a, in a discussion, um, this is part of God's creation. Man is part of God's creation, so th this is this is very, this might might as well be God ending the world exactly. slowly but surely <laughs> through mankind. So, you know, it, it, every argument, I mean, every counter, all these conflicting like Big Bang theory yeah, yeah, and, yeah. and and and, ev and creation, they can marry each. Other. I mean, what's this? Let there be light, Big Bang. I mean, <laughs> We, we always oppose these things, but they can actually... Well, there's a way of, that's another way of looking at it. In other words, Mike, there are other way, different ways of looking at the world. None of them correct, none of them wrong. It's just a different way of looking at the world because we don't know squat about a lot of things in life. Yeah. In fact, our, you know, our kind, we've only been around 200,000 years or so, the, the Homo sapiens, right? But the world has been around, the universe has been around for billions and billions of years. We, have no, we, we cannot imagine to understand... That's why... We cannot imagine to understand uh, where we are now in, in time and place. That's why we asked me about faith. Where is it coming from? It's my parents. As I said, uh, I gave that example. It's just how it's been for me. Pray, prayers ans answered. Understa understanding why, un why some prayers are unanswered. I've had a, a lot of experience with paranormal. Like things I can't explain. Good and bad. And it just, for me, leads credence to the argument that there is a dimension that we cannot see. Like a multiverse or... Whatever it is, but it, there, there is a dimension that is not physical, that is not of this world, that is not. Maybe at some point science will be able to explain it. Yeah, at some point. Yeah. Mike, one of the things that I'm I'm sort of confused about is uh, as as you're 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 obviously like me as well, and most of us here in the world, if you really think about it, we're a, all a bundle of contradictions, right? Yeah. Whether we like it or not, some people just don't seem to uh, see what we're what we're trying to explain to them. But one of the things that I don't understand about you is that you're a man of faith, but you're also a pretty a smart person and. Why would you assume assume that there is a, a higher power than there's uh, when, uh, there's a God and you have faith in it when in fact uh, you know uh, the data science you mentioned which you believe in you said uh, will probably eventually find uh, whatever it is that you call they a, 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 a God <laughs> but you know w why do you not reserve judgment why do you say 
Oh, there is a gun. I know. Science will find it. Why don't you say, hey, wait a minute. We don't know squat. We don't know anything. Uh, you know. Why would you? I'm not going to assume anything. I'm not going to believe in something that I haven't proven yet. But we'll see. I, I, I but have... Jigs. Okay. You know what's more careless? What's is more... to assume that you're sure that there isn't. No. The, no. You, 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 you know can, what? You, you can't, science. You can't, wait, you can't, can I just say You, can, can I, you no. can't assume that. No, but... You're not assuming no, but anything. Science. You talk about science. Yeah. What is when we were in grade school in science class? What what were the what what's the one quality of a scientist that was taught in at least Philippine uh, science classes? I'm not sure, but I think one of the qualities of a scientist open mindedness, op- open mindedness, and so and, that's it, and and humility, yeah. So it's open mindedness. Yeah. So why do I have faith? Because faith gives me parameters and possibilities. Limitless. Okay. Faith allows. Wait a minute. Those are contradictions. Yes. Uh, parameters and yes. limitless. What do you Why? mean? Why? Because faith, my faith, uh, tells me that there are certain things uh, you can do because you have free will, but maybe you shouldn't if you want to subscribe to this faith. Okay. If you want to continue, you don't have to. So is so it, is your faith a matter of convenience because you want no. parameters? You want rules in your life? Uh, I like it. Yeah, I like it. It's an adult decision. It, it doesn't matter if it's wrong or right. Uh, whether you like it or not, it doesn't make it wrong or right, I mean. I'm sorry? Um, it doesn't make it wrong or right because you like it. No, it's a choice. Okay. I made this choice. It's an adult decision. I didn't have to continue being Catholic. Okay. I'm 36 years old. I'm just... Uh, yeah. So, I like that my faith sets certain parameters. Exactly. But the fact that it believes in something that is of not... not be, that is of... Uh, not... Uh, that is invisible, that is not of this world, also encourages me uh, to believe in limitless possibilities. So there are parameters and there are limitless possibilities. But you assume time. you assume something in that limitless possibility, you call it God. Well, that's because I made a conscious decision to subscribe to this faith. Okay. And I don't impose it on other people. Of course not. And others may not believe it. But just because they don't feel what I feel, they don't they have not experienced what I experienced in my journey of faith, and then I'm far from 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 getting or getting answers for some of my my questions, and I'm fine with that. Um, I like that there's curiosity. I like that I'm open to being wrong when the time comes that there is no God. Mm-hmm. Then we just cease to exist. What but, do you mean? What do you mean? For example, uh, this is why do you cease to exist no, if no, there's if no God? If there's, if there's no life after death, you know, some some atheists be, think that we just Stop. Yeah, we, we, we're star stuff, uh, uh, contemplating on star stuff. We are what the, 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 the it's universe a nice is, thought. Uh, <laughs> that the universe is made of. In fact, so I'll tell you yeah, something. Yeah, yeah. Um, so I went to Loch Ness. M- Loch Ness. In, in, the Loch Ness. The Loch Ness monster yeah, place? Yeah. So I went to Inverness okay. in June. So I went, I went the distance and uh, by myself. When I went there, the, the, that castle. Uh, that ruins the ruins okay, there okay. by Loch Lake Ness, where the Loch Ness monster supposedly, supposedly. is. Supposedly, legend so, has it. And then I was planning to swim, but uh, it was too too cold. I mean, I would die. You wanted I, to meet the Loch Ness monster. Whatever. Himself? I just wanted to be there. It was a childhood fascination of mine, um, and I'm just a child really until now, living my dreams. So just I'm basically still a child. Um, so I went there. I enjoyed my time, going and <laughs> incidentally. When I was in Inverness, when I just checked into the hotel, something came out in the news uh, about, uh, well, the DNA samples. I mean, they got some uh, like a water sample from Loch Ness. Oh, the Loch Ness yeah. River. It's yeah. a river, right? A lake? No, it's a lake. Ness is a Scottish for lake. Mm. And, uh, Loch, sorry. Loch is Scottish for lake. So, apparently there's DNA there that's, that's not from, I mean, the existing species. So anyway, that just fascinated <laughs> me that I was there. So when I was, and I headed back to Manchester and I um, rendezvoused with Emil, okay. the, the guy who was disappointed. From New York. Yeah, from New York. The guy was disappointed because I don't have a firmer opinion on the soggy bill, soggy bill. So he said, do you believe it? I, go, I would rather believe it. You know, this is the thing. People will continue until probably the end of, of time or until. End of their lives at end least. Of, end of their lives or the end of mankind. It was, the, people will continue be, you know, um, trying to prove its existence or, or otherwise. There will always be that. And they and chances are they will never be able to prove it. Since, you know, there's sonar technology, there's DNA now, and there's no one that has been able to disprove it. I'd rather be the person who will be proven right eventually. Because 
okay, it's hard to disprove the Loch Ness Monster. No one has ever disproven. Because when someone presents proof, there will always be a counter-argument. But what if he does, or she, whatever, does exist? So I was the one who believed. Mm -hmm. So I would be proven right. Not the ones who didn't believe. So I just, you know, I'd rather believe than not in anything. Not Santa Claus, but, you know. <laughs> so it is for your own personal convenience that you believe. Would you say that? Yeah. And, because, and, and, you know, you, you, you don't want to bet on not believing. It's what not if, my convenience. Wh what if there's friggin' hell, man? What am I going to do? So I'd rather believe in this one. I'm going to bet on this one because, the, you know, in, in, in this idea, there's, there's a heaven and a hell, and I don't want to go to hell. Well, you know what? Is, is that for your personal convenience no, that you believe in it? Personal... You, you don't want to go to hell or, or something? What? You I've never thought of going to hell. Yeah, but what are you what are you trying to say? You, you're saying that you'd rather believe in it than not. Uh, no, my relationship, uh, my 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 faith is is such that there is a a being there who has been who I've, whose presence I have felt. Maybe it's imagination or whatever it is, but uh, it's just that I, I we are, it's, we are, it's, a, it's a matter of gratefulness. We are, it's a matter of gratefulness. We are wired to believe in something, by the whatever way. Whatever it is, maybe it's genetic memory again. Mm. But in my case, taking into account all of that, uh, in my, like you said, my faith, my journey of faith, the times when I pray and I converse, and I've lived such a, a charmed life for me. No, In my book, I, I, I love my life. The ups and the downs, everything. Um, and I'm just filled with gratefulness. And it's not the idea of heaven or hell. It's just that the idea that I want to be grateful to whoever it is who's guiding me, who's protecting me, who's looking after me, who's making me understand the things that uh, I probably would not have the wisdom to, to discern. Uh, so it's just that. It's really just being grateful. You call it the universe. Other, you know, For me, the universe is God's creation. It's been very kind to me. And, I'm, and that gratefulness... Sometimes I'm, it manifests it manifests in the way I deal with other people. And um, for example, on Sunday, I was at the Baptist and then I went out of my way to help two other people who I didn't want to help because it was very inconvenient. Um, it's a political. So I felt like I was, I was going to spend some of my political capital, my goodwill for these two who can... I'm sure could take care of themselves. They're very, very prominent, powerful people, but they humbled themselves and asked for my help for the, for that particular. Uh, for, for no, these are two separate issues. Okay, it's okay. I, it's okay. I uh, so I went out of my way. I don't know if it will help them, but whatever. The next day, I my best friend and I received very good news about uh, something we've been working hard. For, no? I just don't want to mention it yet. But <laughs> so, you know, see, sometimes <laughs> I'm speculating, really. But see, sometimes it, you go out of the, your way for other people, and the universe returns to favor. So that that's how I operate. That's why your Facebook uh, profile is just that you're an alchemist. <laughs> <laughs> I believe in that, in um, not technically, because I've not really changed uh, simple metal to gold or anything. <laughs> but it's it's that I've. In my life, I've turned a lot of things around, and 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 I've made things manifest out of thin air, ideas that have come to fruition, uh, business ideas or whatever. You know, Mike, we have been we have been talking for I don't know two hours oh, now, really? uh, and um, you know we could go on all day, and we have so I have so many questions left in my phone book, in my phone notes, but um, uh, I guess uh, we're running out of time, so <laughs> I'm just gonna try to wrap this up as best as I can. Uh, with all this that's going on with the world these days, Mike, all the chaos, all the, all the fake news, all the, all the, all, all the conflict, uh, you know, there's a nuclear warheads faced uh, <laughs> uh, towards each other, all these, uh, uh, you know, all, these, uh, all the tumultuous things that are going on with the world today. Um, what do you think uh, can we do, Mike? How can you, uh, what idea do you think is the best way to make uh, this planet oh, a gosh. better place to live in, Mike? No one has... Uh the answer, no. Yeah, I but, mean, but the, we don't have a panacea. Yeah, of course, for no. all our but, ills. But what do you think? How, how can we make things a little bit better? Maybe not for the world, just for us here in the Philippines, uh, for least, us here in Cebu. I think you know this is a world that's become so sensitive, a world where people are easily offended, and um, I just think that if we were a little more considerate of other people, not just our feelings and how we're offended, but 
if we go out of our that's the basic root of why they're sh- you know if why of why good manners is is taught good manners yeah good manners B- you know good manners emanates from consideration mm-hmm. of other people and also you're breeding right so yeah you go out of your way to be kind to be courteous you open the door that <laughs> you don't need to be offended if you're a woman if a guy opens the door for you we should open guy or girl you should open doors for each other for other people yeah you shouldn't be rushing to the elevator when people are still getting out i mean it's really just considering other people if we considered other people more often then we'd be kinder automatically and a kinder world is a better world so it's it's just that it's it sounds like a simpleton idea but really a lot of our there was an interview a few uh, weeks ago uh with uh uh, mad scientist Elon Musk, uh, you know the guy who is is, is a man behind Tesla, yeah, of SpaceX, like and uh, AI, the real life Iron Man, AI and, and and all that stuff, solar energy. He was uh, he was asked uh, in an interview with one of the podcasts that I listened to, and uh, at the end of the day, he said, "You know what? I, it, it may sound corny, but love is the answer." He said, "Love is the answer, man." Uh, well, it's just. Uh a paraphrasing of what I just said. Exactly. You know, if you're kind, you know, there's love there. You love other people. You love yourself. You love what you do. Your enemies? Um, you know what? I've had a number <laughs> of people hate on me, dislike me. But I've never been one to to hold grudges. And I've always just lift it up. You know, I, I just let it go. I, mean, I don't... Uh, other times, I make friends with them again. If I feel that they're kind of malicious and... And it's there's really some something sinister there. Mischief. I just stay away. But yeah, I, I, I forgiveness is hard. But if you've if you I've not mastered it, um, working on it. But um, if you let go and well, in my, in, for a believer, let God, uh, you feel lighter. You feel lighter. And in my case, I feel more blessed. I mean, more more good things happen to you. More of your plans see uh, fruition more of your goals uh, are achieved uh you know why because hate makes you lose sight of the prize you know it makes you waste unnecessarily energy that could be put to better use to more productive use uh like i said to seeing the world building more dreams seeing those dreams come to to reality i mean become reality um but they say that hate is not the opposite of love they say hate is actually uh, uh, the other side of the same coin. They say the opposite of love is indifference. Apathy, yeah. Apathy. So, um, so if I'm it, not a philosopher. Okay. So, <laughs> so whatever it is, okay. um, you can be indifferent, but okay. at least being indifferent doesn't require a lot of your energy or your time. So, you know what uh, I've learned in the past seven or eight years is uh, I've been single for around that time, okay. eight years. Um and I've changed a lot since I'm before. Oh my God, Jigs! I was ruthless. I'm a Sith Lord. <laughs> <laughs> what do you mean? Like you were I know, I- inconsiderate? Is that what you're saying? Not inconsiderate. I was all. I would ruthless? always try. I would always try to be considerate. Okay. But what do you say? Ruthless. But for the people I was considerate for, if they crossed me, if they, if they, if what, they were they were against if you. If they, you know, in exchange for kindness, generosity, or consideration, they betrayed me. I would really make sure that they paid. I was ruthlessly vindictive. Vengeful, yeah, okay. Oh, yeah, for sure. Okay. This was eight years ago? No, more. Okay. <laughs> maybe maybe <laughs> ten years ago. So what happened? What snapped? Uh, well, I, you, I think you, you grow up. Okay. You grow up. Was there like a light bulb moment when that happened? When My you became... faith has played a very important role. Okay. My times with former President Arroyo uh, in detention. And this was a former Humbling president. Humbling experience, right? Oh, yeah. For sure. This is a former president. She has reached the apex of human achievement, being the president of her country. And then to, to have to face this shame, the shame and humiliation of arrest post-presidency. And to have the restraint, you know, and, and not feed that anger or that hatred. That was really uh, inspiring to me. Um, and it made me see things differently. And also her faith. Uh, how, she, how she weathered her personal storm, political and personal storm. Storms, no. So, the the past uh, eight years have been just that. Um, it's a con. It's a. It was a process. It was like it wasn't like a one time thing. Like I wake up one day and say, okay, I'm not gonna be vindictive anymore. No, before you see, you have power, you use it. That was that was it. 
and you can be creative <laughs> when you do it. And it was fun. Uh. And then Emily Thorne had that revenge series, and it was fun. <laughs> but, you know, I was looking at that. In fact, I was watching that series throughout, I don't know, eight years. four or five seasons. <laughs> I don't know. So at some point, it overlapped. And I was just disgusted at the, the, all, the, all the time she spent at ex- but that was pretty much you, right? No, no, I wasn't to that extent. She would kill people, but okay. uh, but I was really, I think I thought it was I thought it was pathetic that <laughs> oh my god to, to have your life defined by revenge. It's well, it's an interesting series. It was a guilty pleasure of mine, but I was I don't want to be that, you know. So, but it was part of. I mean, the whole thing. It was so you are more forgiving, uh, Mike Lopez now. So much more, and. Um, well, my exes are still we're, we're friends. Mm-hmm. I'd like to think it's. I mean, I I can't. No, we cannot uh, control other people's ideas or uh, other feelings. people's feelings toward us. But uh, we can control ours. So you just give give it out. If they don't give it back, it doesn't matter. I mean, you did your part. Uh, they're not your accountability. <laughs> Your accountability is yourself, your actions. So, so to, the secret to making things better is uh, to be considerate. Um, uh, in that uh, memoir of sorts that you wrote when you were in, in, in college, Mike, about the trajectory of your life, 10 years, so when you were turned 30, mm-hmm. turned 40, well, what is, uh, what is uh, Mike Lopez left, what has Mike Lopez left to do in oh, the coming years? So t- much t- more. Tell us about what... what, what the I'm, in my, I'm in the 30s, okay. so I'm, I'm actually... Doing what I intended to do, okay. And we're we're doing we're starting some business. Uh, at least I have an outlet in government that doesn't require so much of my time, and that doesn't require me to divest. I can still try to pursue for as long as there's no conflict of interest uh, with my job in the Port Authority. So I'm happy to have been given at least that outlet, that platform, and it's something that's uh, at least um, focused on Cebu's economic development, not anywhere else. At least it's very focused. It's port, and it's Cebu. So, we are Cebu because of the port. Even way before the airport, Cebu became a the first uh, settlement, the oldest Philippine city and province because we had a port, because of the traders they came here. Yes, in fact, we, I think that's where we got our name, right? Cebu so, means so, uh, Cebu, meaning to say uh, so we, we, we Cebu, Cebu uh-huh. meaning to say we. I actually got this from Cabino uh, Guerrero. He says that mm-hmm. Cebu is actually the word that says uh, Cebu, meaning the the value of your 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 commodity is similar to mine. Cebu sila. So so could be. It, it was the trade capital that's of the Philippines. That's interesting. I've yeah. never heard of that, but that let's check it. <laughs> but <laughs> but maybe Cabino, of course, he knows his stuff. But um, see, I mean, it's we became a trading center because of the port. So. We will never be able. I mean, so the, in the only way to move forward to future to the future is to celebrate our past no? and learn from its our mistakes, but move forward. So um, politics is out of the question for Mike for Lopez. For now, oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> no. if I become wealthy enough, okay, to live comfortable. I mean, I'm not poor. Okay, um, but if I can, based on my, you know, I'll give you. I'll tell you something. When I was in <laughs> high school. Oh no, when I was in college and even high school, I would compute my grades. Mamundo ko. What do you mean? It's not the most responsible thing to do, so kids don't do this at home. Okay. Mamundo ko, you know, uh, I would. Grades? How would you put no, grades? No, for example, I would compute it basically in a semester how many quizzes, how many tests, how okay. many periodical. I would compute it so that I have enough to have a decent grade. Okay. Not necessarily stellar performance like 95. Uh-huh. Or not. And if I have enough, I'd not, I, I'd cut class. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> this is the truth. Not something I'm proud of, but this is, this is how I am. So, so that I enjoy everything. Okay. I don't miss, you know, YOLO before that even, <laughs> what was, before YOLO was coined. But I would do that. So I would have enough time to enjoy, relax, go around, okay. watch movies. Okay. Um, in, in, in San Carlos, sometimes we would go, we would drive to, to Busay? Busay to eat, uh, well, Pass beside sweet corn, go to the beach, and go come back. No later period, but I would compute it so that I never failed, like failed a, a, a course, a subject. But I would compute it in mamundo ko. If I have enough <laughs> to pass, then so I, w- what I don't. What put you're pressure. saying, what you're saying is mamundo ka before you go into politics. Correct. But it, it is, but it is <laughs> in the in the bucket list. 
not a bucket list. It's just uh, one of the possibilities I, I you've put been there. In, you've been in public service for more than 10 years, right? You, you only gave yourself 10 years when you, uh, so, you know, straight out of college, you said, yeah, I'm going to give myself 10 years. Yeah. Uh, are you in love with, with the, the, uh, the public service thing that uh, you're in it's now, that, that you have overextended your say, so, stay, so to no, speak? No, this is just, like I said, an outlet. It, okay. doesn't, it's, it doesn't take up so much of my time. Mm-hmm. Uh, now I'm just busy, uh, uh, what do you call this, uh, making sure that the timeline is Still honored okay. you know and that i see more of the world because i had a surge i had sur- I, there was a there was a time that uh, i was traveling a lot and then for some reason i suffered a slump i didn't want to i didn't want to travel at all even free free trips invitations i would turn them down and then and then i i went to the us in 2017 and then a lot of alone so i would go interstate uh by myself, I drove around and said, oh my God. What are you doing? <laughs> what, I'm missing out on so much. I mean, I recalled how I love traveling uh, before. So, you know, I have to get my act together. And then I had surgery and then that, that, that sort of thing. What do you happened. mean you had to get your act together? What, what do you no, mean? I mean, I was... The uh, traveling in the United States was the catalyst? What did you see? Driving that? by myself. Okay. Uh, you, you could have done that here. Driving no, I myself. drive around. That's, okay. that's how I okay. clear my head. But when I was driving interstate, and they said, oh, are you sure you're going to go through the New Jersey Turnpike? Okay. And you've never driven in the East Coast, in the West Coast, yes. I said, I, so I rented a car. I mean, it's, you know, the sense of adventure. Mm. There's just so much to do, so much to experience, so much to see, so many people to meet, so much food to eat, uh, that we shouldn't just be stuck. Uh, Cebu will always be my home the world can be our playground so that's that's the mindset that i cultivated the past two years so the third my 30s would be about that traveling and just making sure that i save for retirement and for my 40s onwards if i do if there's an opportunity because you know like i said it's in the genes if if kaya if i have the, the passion for it still if i see that i have been unrelenting on my non-negotiables, if I've been able to preserve them for the most part, the most important parts, because there are certain things that you really have to let go, you know. Or negotiate, right? Yeah, <laughs> but there are non-negotiables. And so I'm somehow I'm finding... Give me, give me one, one nego- non-negotiable for you, Mike, before we wrap this up. Oh, okay. You can't uh, be bribed. Okay. No? But uh, so they say, oh, what if, uh, what if it's required to... You're, you're, you're the CPA, right? Yeah. So, for example, if it's required, uh, you anger everyone. And then you, you're not able to, just a hypothetical, so then accept it without ha- it having to go through your hands and let them give it to... Somebody else? Well, someone who deserves it, okay. someone who needs it. So, technically, it it's didn't it. go to me. Okay. It helped someone. Okay. So, that's like a, you know, that's like an example of a middle ground. But that's, that's, that's negotiating it. That's that's what I'm saying. Oh, okay. um, but, but you're not. You don't want to negotiate. But that. to the extent that you received it for yourself, uh, technically and well, it, literally, it you didn't. Still didn't. No. But uh, you say, oh, just give it there. Don't give it to me. But that will not be a factor for my yes or no. So, I'm just giving an example okay. of what what it could be. It's Mike, hypothetical. Um, we have thousands of, of, of viewers that will be watching this one, maybe live or maybe uh, on a delayed basis. Uh, you look like you um, lived a, already lived a full life at, at uh, your 30s, or, and uh, you look like you, you're, uh, you know what you want, you know what you're doing. Uh, what is your message to those uh, viewers out there who are still trying to find the way in life and in everything, well, and navigating through this uh, difficult world of ours? I guess uh, just just believe i mean that uh, there that nothing is impossible so that's the only way that you can start to dream uh, dreams i think uh, a life without dreams without ambition without goals is a meaningless or at the very least boring life you wouldn't want that you would want an adventure and and if the adventure entails some hardship some challenges some sacrifices some scratches here and there some bruises. Some bruises. It's okay. You know, and if you die in the process, <laughs> then you've lived a fun life. You know, it's like stuff uh, stuff uh, novels are made of. Uh, but just dream. You know, dream big dreams. 
make sure you work hard to fulfill those dreams. And along the way, don't step on other people's toes. Believe in karma. Believe in some divine or universe, um, you know, unseen hand. You don't have to believe in God, but there is retribution there. There will always be comeuppance. Uh, that's, I think, the law of nature. Um, the cycle. It's a cycle. The so, circle. So believe in karma. Don't step on other people's toes on your way to the top. And for the people who have wronged you, forgive and let go, including yourself. Cut yourself some slack. Don't dwell on what others have done or what others failed to do. Just, you know, process it, learn from it, and focus on the prize. Focus on, on, on living life. It's such a beautiful life. I mean, and if you can, master the ability to understand why sometimes we don't have our way. And that's the easiest path to happiness. Understand why we don't have our way all, all the, the time. time. Okay. Yeah, because... You know, we have certain expectations. We, we set certain expectations uh, from ourselves, from other people, from our day, from, 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 from this podcast. We don't meet those expectations. We, we get disappointed. I'm not like that. I write shoots. You know? But then you, you, there's always a way to rationalize it, to romanticize it. It may be escapist, but it's one way of coping with, with life's uh, Unpredictability, yeah? Yeah, and, and just be ready for everything. And you know what? For example, um, in my case, it doesn't have to be applicable to everyone, but last year, I got food poisoning in the House of Parliament. Yeah, I saw that. Uh, <laughs> in, in the UK. So I nearly died. Um, my, my heart was racing uh, at a rate of 170, 180. And then I said, they said, do you need to go to the hospital? No, no, no. I go to the clinic. I went live. Pa. I said, no, let's finish <laughs> Facebook this. live. Yeah. Let's finish this meeting. So you weren't that sick. <laughs> no, no. I called the house. Okay. I called the house. Okay. It was me saying goodbye okay. in case. Oh. But you know what? So I was there. And they t really told me it's, it's comroid poisoning. I was afraid that maybe it was a terrorist attack. Because I was in <laughs> parliament. I mean, you go through that kind of security w worse than an airport. Okay. And it was by invitation. So anyway, I was there in, I think it's called Westminster Hall. I forget what it's called. But anyway, that hall inside the Palace of, of Westminster. So maybe it's Westminster Hall. It's a grand hall. It's huge. That's where Winston Churchill was laid in state and other heads of state, like other kings mm -hmm. and queens in the past were laid in state. That's where, God forbid, when the time comes that Her Majesty passes on, that's where she'll be laid in state. That's where... Uh, what's his name? Thomas More. He's my favorite saint. Mm. Patron saint of politicians and statesmen. <laughs> That's where he was sentenced to death for his Catholic faith. Um, I was like, okay, so if I die here, the thing is the protocol is if you die there, you can't be declared dead until you're moved out. That's the protocol. So I said, but it's never happened. No one has ever died there. So I said, see, I will make history. <laughs> you're the first person to die. <laughs> but people will say, he died there but he actually was proclaimed that much later on and he's the first person to ever had that kind of a, uh, you know to be in that situation but anyway and he said maybe the queen would say oh he beat me to it because he's <laughs> you know he, he was dead there but anyway i was joking about it and then i had a meeting with a, a friend of ours a baroness and she was waiting and she said Oh, he's, he, he, you're sick. So why didn't you go to the hospital? No, no, no. I will honor my commitment. I'll be late, but I'll be there. I will show up. So I went. And it was like bloodshot, everything. You can't see my eyes. I was like a vampire. After our meeting was done, I said, okay, I will go to the hospital. <laughs> so please, we got to the hospital. This is the ER. Across is, this is St. Mary's. Across is the Lindo Hall. That's where the royals would come out with their babies. There's always that picture with... Uh, what's her name? Kate bringing in George, mm. Diana bringing out William. <laughs> I said, Co I was telling Eric, my best friend, Co Rick, can you wear your shade? Show I. Because I have to wear mine. Show I. Rick, I have to take a photo. <laughs> 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 so, ER, Co the ER can wait. It's just right across. Let's just take this photo. So, we took the photo, you know? It's just really a uh, positive disposition. Anyway, I said, so this year I went back. We launched our company there. 
Uh, we registered a company. We launched it in the House of Lords in Parliament. Not in the House of Commons. In the House of Lords okay. in Parliament. The first Filipino, private Filipino event. Um, so what am I saying? So last year, I nearly died there. Now, at the same time, September, I went back with a big, with a big bang. So, you know, what doesn't kill you? <laughs> Makes you stronger. Yeah. Or, or Pardon whatever. me for the cliche, yeah. right? So, <laughs> yeah, but you just, you know, it, it, not everything will go your way. But if you have, uh, it's really a matter of attitude more and than anything. Persistence you, as well is, is, is key. Yeah, I guess persistence. But I think, well, success, different people have different definitions of, of success. But being happy, and I'm actually quite content, mm -hmm. generally. If you know, if, if so, would 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 that be uh, your yardstick for for success? Of being content, being full of joy. I'm content with whatever whatever is given me. Um, Comes your way. Yeah, but I don't settle for that. That doesn't mean that I'm not content. I'm content. What whatever I do, whatever I churn out, it's just my offering. To the world, okay. You know, um, there's this uh, the parable of the talents. Tell us about it in, in the Bible. Um, I sound like a born again Christian quoting the Bible, but uh, the parable of the talents is about this man who was given a, few, like, a number of talents. I don't remember exactly how many. Let's say three, or, or he was a number of talents. Talents. Okay. He was gifted talents. That he was given more. Let's say five or six. I don't remember the exact uh, number, but he was so afraid. To use them, he buried them, he hid them from the world. But there was another person who was given fewer talents. But he used them, maximized them. When the master came back, he told the man who buried the his talents, talents that you're a wicked man. You're just greedy, you know, you just kept it to yourself. You're given talents, you use them. So I'm content. I like the life I've been given. I like my life now. But whatever I do, it's just because I think it would be a disservice. If you don't use your skills, to your myself, talent. to people, we all have talents. No, we all have something to contribute, and I think it's a disservice to yourself. And if you're a believer, to your God, if you just sit there idly watching things go idly by, no, I mean uh, sitting idly by while things happen. So uh, that's why apathy is the opposite of love. That's why for me, <laughs> I'm content, but I feel a certain sense of responsibility to at least make good use of whatever I've been given. Hopefully. Uh, you know, for the better. Um, but of course, along the way, you may encounter mistakes, so you cut yourself some stuff. But that's it. So, yeah, just contentment. And Mike, I, I'm not, I'm not going to say this is the end of the interview because it's it's never going to be the end. But I, let's just say uh, maybe we'll talk to each other again one of these days and talk about something else. Uh, maybe we can talk about your company in the United Kingdom that uh, is probably <laughs> going to be exploding oh by the gosh. time a br a Brexit happens or again, whatever it expectations is. Expectations <laughs> lower than. <laughs> <laughs> but hey, you declare to the universe, Correct. and, the, and the, the universe responds positively, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Mike Acevedo Lopez, a CPA commissioner, and of course, uh, he's also uh, an entrepreneur, and um, so many other hats. The lover of life. The lover of life, uh, Mr. Mike. Thank you so much. Sir. Thank you, Jake. Thank you. It was a pleasure. Thank, thank you so much. Me. Thank you, Dessert Factory, for our uh, coffee and dessert. Yes, We're going to uh, enjoy this one. Their Ayala branch is already open to serve you. I, I know you like their Ayala yes, branch, right? Yes, because I went there and uh, it was closed. <laughs> it's now open, Mike. It's now open. Thank great. goodness. Thank okay. you so much, guys. Goodbye. Thank you. Thank you for watching the Philosopher Podcast. <laughs>